R. E. Lee, A Biography, Volume 1, Chapters 5 through 11. Written by Douglas Southall Freeman. Published by Charles Scribner's Sons, New York and London, 1934. Digitalization by Bill Thayer. Audiobook produced by Open Audio Recordings and read by Nancy, a Microsoft Azure AI neural voice. Chapter 5 Sorrow and Scandal Come to the Lees. In holiday seasons, Robert and Smith Lee sometimes arranged to have their furloughs run simultaneously, and they would join their elder brother, Carter, in mirthful journeyings to the homes of their kinspeople. There would be laughter, teasing, sprightly anecdote, and much harmless gallantry. When liquor was passed, Robert and Smith would decline, but Carter was agreeable. I have always told these boys, he would say, that I would drink their share of wine, provided they would keep me generously supplied. Carter was the center of amusement at these parties, for his social gifts were of the highest and his humor keener than that of either of his brothers. Robert's most favorable impression was made by the dignity of his fine person and by his gracious, considerate manners. On one of his visits, his manners and his regard for his elders brought him no little embarrassment. In the company there chanced to be a bibulous old gentleman who was much pleased with the clean, high-minded cadet. The night before Robert left, this worthy came to the boys' room. To quote a feminine biographer who did not fail to point the moral, the veteran of many a drinking bout lamented the idle and useless life into which he had fallen, excusing himself upon the score of loneliness and the sorrow which weighed upon him in the loss of those most dear. In the most impressive manner he besought his young guest to be warned by his example, prayed him to cherish the good habits he had already acquired, and promised to listen to his entreaties that he would change his own life, and thereby secure more entirely his respect and affection. So runs the story, sober history suggests that the gentleman had been to the shrine of Bacchus before he staggered to the confessional. It probably took all of Robert's tact of the dispose of the penitent and to get him out of the room. Barring a repetition of such a scene, the summer after his graduation should have been for Robert the happiest of all these seasons of carefree visiting, but it was, instead, one of the saddest periods of his life. The joy of homecoming was ruined by the illness of his mother. Her health had been bad during the winter, though there had been some signs of improvement with the spring. When Robert arrived, she was at Ravensworth in a worse condition than ever and was ready to die. Charles Carter was developing his practice, Smith was progressing in the Navy, and in 1826 had married William Lewis Marshall, a minister who later became an attorney of station, Mildred, in her nineteenth year, was in friendly hands. And now Robert was embarking on a career of high promise. And Carter Lee had seen it through, but the struggle had cost her all her vitality. She could fight for nothing further. Robert immediately resumed his old duties as a nurse. He mixed her medicines, administered them, and watched by her bed almost continuously. When he left her room, her gaze followed him, and she would look steadily at the door until he entered again. It was not a long siege this time. On July 10, Robert saw the light leave her eye and the last faint breath fail her. He turned from the bed in a grief that he never forgot. She was buried at Ravensworth, and there her ashes remained until they were moved to rest in a vault at Lexington, Virginia, near those of her son, whither also, in 1913, the bones of Henry Lee were brought from Cumberland Island. And Carter Lee was 56 when she died. She had been a mother for 31 years and a widow for 11. Nearly all her married life of two decades and a half had been clouded with financial worry. For at least seventeen years before her death, she had carried the burden of maintaining the family on her personal income. Of all that she thought and planned and suffered during those years, hardly an echo has survived the indifferent roar of a hurrying century. The scant score of letters in her autograph that now remain and the few references to her in the extant correspondence of her kinspeople and friends do not suffice to give more than the most shadowy outlines of her personality. She had patience in misfortune, she used wisely the little that she possessed, she served a God who was very real to her, she kept her friends and she loved her kin, she had the wisdom and skill with which to vitalize for her children the virtue of self-control, she made their interests her own, she must have had much of the Carter interest in life and some of the Carter sense of humor, she had high, uncomplaining courage in facing continued adversity. This much is known. 
but in what manner she dealt with a spendthrift husband seventeen years her senior, and what she thought of the life she had left at Shirley or of the life she had led among the Lees, and how she went about the rearing of Robert, and whether she believed he would become a great man, she does not tell us. None of her letters to Robert is known to be in existence, and only two of those to Smith are left. The earlier of these exhibits her devotion to her children and to her kinspeople. It follows. Georgetown, April 10, 1827. My dear son, I believe my last letter to you was conveyed by Mr. Delaney. I thank God I have been spared to write to you again, for my health has declined very much in the last two years, and I never calculate on living longer than from season to another. I am very happy to learn from Mr. Delaney that the North Carolina will return home as soon as the vessel reaches the Mediterranean. I hope to see both of my dear boys home in June. Robert will then have been absent two years. He is much pleased with his situation at West Point, has advanced rapidly, never having received a mark or demerit an assistant professor of mathematics which appointment gives him $10 per month in addition to his monthly allowance. The captain, as Ropt calls Carter, is driving on at law. He was admitted to the bar of the Supreme Court during the last session, so I hope in time he will be in a more prosperous situation. I think when I last wrote you I informed you of N's intended marriage, which was solemnized on the 22nd of June. This is the eighth day since the birth of her daughter who lived only a few hours, and you can readily imagine from N's disposition how much she deplored the event. Mildred has grown since you were here, and I hope you will find her improved in some respects, she is as fond of books as the captain, and both do very little else, but read, so you will know how the family affairs are conducted, when you consider that I am too much of an inviled to take part in the management of them that I formerly did. Alas, alas, I wish I had my little boy Smith and Ropt living with me again. My brother Bernard's three elder daughters and Captain Henry spent the last four months with us. They are accomplished pretty girls, Mildred is quite a beauty, Charles is also a handsome man, very honorable and correct. They left us this day week to go to Shirley. They were accompanied by your Uncle Williams, Shirley, John Hill Carter, and Carter Lee. They will return to philosophy the latter part of this month to await the return of their father from England they returned from America last June after an absence of five years. Your relations generally are going on as much as when you knew them, I believe all living that you left last, excepting your uncle Randolph, dear Blanton Carter, and your uncle R. B. Lee who died a few weeks ago poor Alexandria has suffered much by fire this winter. Mr. Delaney will give you the particulars, it has lost some of its old inhabitants too. Captain Dangerfield, Mr. Irvin, dear Dr. Dick, and Sam Thompson. My dear Smith, I have told you everything I thought interesting to you and now have arrived at the disagreeable point in my letter, the obligation I feel to chide you for never writing to your mother more especially as her health is so impaired that you cannot calculate on ever seeing her again, but exclusive of my desire to hear from you I lament your dislike of writing because it will be such a disadvantage to you through life. A man that cannot write a good letter on business or on the subject of familiar letters will make an awkward figure in every situation and will find himself greatly at a loss on any occasion. Indeed, I cannot imagine how he could pass through life with satisfaction and respectability would you arrive at any eminence in your profession, my dear Smith, it will be essential to your reputation to write a good letter, the knowledge of which cannot be acquired in after life. You must write often now in the days of your youth, and form a good style, let me entreat you my dear son to write often to me, if your letters are not well written at first you will improve after a while, and I promise no I shall see but mine. I must again mention my hopes of seeing you in June and my disease is an unconquerable one but the symptoms that present are such as do not threaten a speedy death, but as all things are uncertain in this world nothing so precarious as our hold on life, I must beg you my dear child always to know how anxious I am about your welfare neither of which can be attained without exertion on your part. You must repel every evil and allow yourself to indulge in such habits only as are consistent with religion and morality. Oh that I could impart to you the knowledge gained from the experience of fifty-four years, then would you be convinced of the vanity of every pursuit not under the control of the most inflexible virtue. I wish the powers of my mind were equal to the affections of my heart, then could I give you such precepts as would influence your conduct through life, but as the advantage has been denied me I must entreat you my dear son to reflect often on your poor mother's solicitude for you. Let it stimulate you to require the best habits and indulge not one that you could not remember on your deathbed with satisfaction keep my letters that you may read them when I can write no more they will awaken your 
mother's great fondness for you and perhaps prove incentive to the cultivation of these virtues she was most desirous you should possess during your prayers with mine my dear son that God may bless you and impart to your mind every good gift and best of all the peace which passeth all understanding, your devoted mother. And H. Lee. The second letter was written not long before her end, and it showed how the long fight wore on her nerves. It reads, Georgetown, March 24, 1829. I thought when I parted with you, dear Smith, that your contemplated voyage was not objected to, inasmuch as you would be absent but a short time and it would probably prevent your being sent out soon again, but I have been uneasy all day from reading the papers last night that the pirates were sometimes secreted in part of the island into which ships of war could not go, and that boats were sent to apprehend them. Now my dear Smith these expeditions in boats must be attended with great danger and I trust in God you will avoid as much as possible placing yourself in such perilous situations. I entreat you to write to me from New York and let me know all the plans respecting your cruise as far as you have been made acquainted with them. You left us Saturday and this is Tuesday evening. So that I cannot have much to tell you. Nanny and Matilda visited us on last Sunday after church to console with us on your loss. They say they are truly sorry they shall have no more sleigh rides, no more pretty flowers, no more music presented them, no kind bow to escort them in the walks this spring, but insist on your coming back here when you return from Cuba and positively forbid you going to Colombia with the new minister. Catherine Mason came yesterday to beg for your profile and Carter insists on being allowed to carry her one this evening which he will sell for a high price. He wishes he had thought of it before you went, he says, and he would have made master ranks cut many and would have sold them to your favorites, by the way of getting a little money. My dear Smith, I am very unhappy about you since I read that paragraph in the paper respecting the pirates. If you can, give me some comfort on the subject. And wept often in the course of the day you left us, and is still grieved about you. I beg you will not go to Columbia without coming home first. I pray to God to protect and bless you my dear son. And H. Lee. Mildred is downstairs and does not know I am writing to you or would beg to be tenderly presented to you. And sends more love than my paper could hold. God bless you, God bless you. These letters are the only picture of herself that she has left. Much that a curious world would like to know about the mother of her son can never be established. For a time after her death, Robert apparently was in Georgetown, engaged, no doubt, in helping to settle his mother's estate. She had prepared a will not long before her death, so there was little difficulty in executing her wishes. To in Marshall, she left her maid and the negress's child, together with three slaves that were then with Mrs. Marshall. To her also went the white tea china, the wardrobe, two of the mother's tablecloths, she had but four, and half the napkins and wearing apparel. Mildred received the old family servant Nat, the carriage and horses, the piano, the other two good tablecloths, and an equal share of the napkins and wearing apparel. Each daughter was given, in addition, $10,000 of the principal of the trust fund which had been prudently invested in bank stock. The rest of her property Mrs. Lee directed her executor to sell and to divide the proceeds among her three sons. The size of the bond given when the will was probated in Fairfax County would indicate that the amount allotted the boys was hardly more than $3,000 each. It was sad, sad business breaking up the home in Georgetown and dividing the treasures to which and Lee had clung through her darkest days. Robert doubtless was relieved when he was able to return to Virginia about August 1st and sojourn with relatives. But, with the buoyancy of youth, he quickly recovered from the immediate grief of his mother's death and, as one of his cousins remembered, was as full of life, fun and particularly teasing, as any of us. He visited much at Eastern View, the Randolph home in Fouquier, but there was another mansion to which his interest and his horse were turning very frequently. This was Arlington, the home of George Washington Park Custis, on the hills above Alexandria, overlooking the country's capital. Custis was the grandson of Mrs. George Washington and was the adopted son of Washington. Having resided at Mount Vernon from 1782, when he was an infant, until the end of his grandmother's life in 1802, he had observed Washington closely during the general's last years. His temperament was such that he delighted in the sentimental appellation, the child of Mount Vernon, which clung to him all his days, though he measured out his full seventy years and more. 
Arlington had been built by him after the death of his grandmother when Mount Vernon had reverted to the Washington family. The house, which was named after an old Custis home on the eastern shore of Virginia, was distinguished more for its site and for the impressive columnated portico with Doric capitals than for interior beauty or convenience. Its rooms, though large, were few and gloomy, the heavy columns dwarf the mansion. It gives the impression of being built to be looked at, rather than to be lived in. To Arlington, in 1806, Custis brought as his bride Mary Lee Fitzhugh, daughter of Colonel and Mrs. William Fitzhugh of Chatham opposite Fredericksburg on the Rappahannock. She was 18 at the time and he was 25, and they had ahead of them 47 years of married life. Of their four children, only one survived infancy. She was a girl, Mary and Randolph Custis, born October 1, 1808, and reared in the amplest luxury. Twenty-one years of age when Robert came home from West Point, she had known him almost all her life, for the families were distantly related through the Lee ancestry of the Randolphs and they visited one another frequently. She was something of a toast in the Lee family, as much admired by Robert's brother Carter as by the boys nearer her own age. I heard of dear Miss Custis yesterday, Carter had written not long before Robert's return from New York, and that she was much afflicted with a cold. She was a frail, blonde girl. Her features were aristocratic, but they were not beautiful. The nose was a trifle too long and the chin a bit too sharp, but she had freshness, bright eyes, a ready smile, and quick, sympathetic interest. If Robert did not actually love her from boyhood, he certainly put her in a place by herself. She it was who drew him to Arlington. When he went away, it was to come again, always with deepening delight in her company. While Robert was visiting at Arlington and at Eastern View, one legacy left to Mildred required his care. This was Nat, the Negro coachman and house servant. Nat was typical of a rather large element among Virginia slaves. He had helped to rear the children, he had served long and loyally, he had shared in all the struggles of the family. None of the Lees ever regarded him otherwise than as a member of the family. And now Nat was sick, with some slow, devitalizing malady. What should be done to provide for him? The carriage would creak no more over the Georgetown streets as Mrs. Lee went out to take the air. The household was broken up. How could he be assured good nursing? While this question was being debated, Robert's orders came. They read as follows. Engineer Order No. 8 Washington, D.C., August 11, 1829 Brevet Second Lieutenant Robert E. Lee will, by the middle of November next, report to Major Samuel Babcock of the Corps of Engineers for duty at Cockspur Island, in the Savannah River, Georgia. C. Greshet Brig General Comage Cockspur Island a godforsaken spot by all accounts, redeemed only by the fact that it was near Savannah, where lived the family of Lee's chum, Jack McKay. But orders were orders, and besides, as the climate there was mild, Nat's health might be improved. So, when Robert said farewell to all his kinspeople and to the young mistress of Arlington, Nat accompanied him on the long sea journey to Savannah. It was a curious companionship for the beginning of active duty in an army which Lee was to leave, more than thirty years afterwards in order, his enemies alleged, to fight for the perpetuation of slavery. The town at which the young lieutenant and the old negro arrived by packet, about November 1, 1829, was a place of some 7,300 people, the largest city in the principal port in a state that had been settled less than 100 years and then counted no more than 300,000 whites in a population of 516,000. Savannah had history, for it had been occupied by the British in 1778, and in October of the following year, it had been besieged by the American and French forces. These operations, which were unsuccessful, had cost the life of Count Pulaski. With that part of the story of the town, Robert was of course familiar from his father's memoirs, for Light Horse Harry had fought farther up the river on which his son was now to labor as an engineer. The same tide that flooded Savannah swept Cumberland Island, where Henry Lee had ended his days. Socially, the town was attractive and cultured. The McKays, who welcomed Lee with open doors, were among the most distinguished of Savannah families, with daughters who were interesting even at first sight. In a few days Lee was introduced to all the civilians who were accounted worth knowing. 
As for the army, Savannah boasted a small garrison of United States artillery, among whom were several officers, with whom Lee became friendly. Jack McKay had been assigned to this garrison. Another of its officers was Lieutenant James A. Chambers of the 2nd Artillery, who may have been distantly connected with Lee. The post was by no means so pleasant as the town. It was, in fact, as drab and desolate as its reputation. Cockspur Island lies 12 miles downstream from Savannah and is the easternmost islet of a number of flats in Tybee Roads, as the mouth of the river is styled. The island is about a mile in length and about two-thirds as wide. Very little of it was above normal tide level at the time of Lee's arrival, and most of it was marshland, flooded daily and completely covered in heavy storms. Up the river was a string of similar swampy islands. Northward, across nearly two miles of water, were Turtle Island and a tangle of flats on the mainland, broken by winding estuaries and untouched by man's labor. To the south of Cockspur Island and separated from it by a narrow channel were other swamps, even more confusing and inhospitable. Eastward the open sea was spread. In summer, Cockspur had virtually to be abandoned because of mosquitoes, heat, and fever. It was, however, a training school for Lee in the practical problems of military engineering and in the management of labor. He came to his duty there at a most advantageous period. Congress had recently begun its first extensive program of coast defenses, which the engineers had the satisfaction of locating, designing, and constructing. Promotion was very slow, and the jealousy of some high functionaries was pronounced, but there probably was never a time of peace in the history of the Corps when it held out so many opportunities or gave young officers so much responsibility as it did when Lee joined it. Lee's orders had indicated that his commanding officer at Cockspur Island was to be Major Samuel Babcock of Massachusetts, one of the earliest graduates of the United States Military Academy. Babcock had been in the Army more than 20 years when Robert was graduated and his health was becoming impaired by his exertions. For that reason, the load of his youthful subordinate was heavy from the very outset. Aside from the engineering duties, Lee had to discharge those of acting assistant commissary of subsistence. It was the only time in his life that he labored in that most thankless of Army services. His engineering work was not always interesting, but it usually was troublesome. The project at Cockspur Island was to locate and subsequently to construct a heavy fort on an island that afforded at best a doubtful foundation. After the site was chosen, embankments had to be reared to keep out the tide. Then a canal had to be constructed, and when this had drained the site, the fort was to be laid out. Into the first stages of this hard work, Robert put all he had learned at West Point and all the strength of his staunch physique. He spent so many days in mud and water, up to his armpits, that a certain interested young woman, up in Virginia, wondered how he ever survived it, and to the end of her days she never ceased to marvel at it. Finding friends in Savannah whenever he could go there, and occupying his leisure hours in letter-writing and in sketching, Lee passed the winter of 1829-30. Such social life as he could have in Savannah must have been less pleasant than it would normally have been to a young man of his temperament because the proud name of the Lee family had become involved in a humiliating public scandal in the very circles where it had stood highest. In 1817, Henry Lee, Robert's half-brother, son of Light Horse Harry by his union to Matilda Lee of Stratford, had married a young woman of means in Westmoreland County. Living as a country gentleman, first at Stratford and then at Fredericksburg, Major Lee had dabbled in letters, much to the neglect of his estate, and had served as assistant postmaster general under J. Q. Adams. In 1827, Henry Lee's affairs had become so much involved that a judgment of $9,000 was procured against him by Henry Stork. As Lee could not meet this, Stratford had been sold for $11,000 and, on June 30, 1828, had formally passed out of the Lee family. Impoverished and embittered, Henry Lee had tried to make a living by writing. By inheritance, he was a Federalist, but he had become a protagonist of Andrew Jackson. He had resided at the Hermitage after the sale of Stratford, had been engaged in arranging Jackson's military papers, and had written several polemic in behalf of Old Hickory. Jackson found these last to be Indy Ted in a temper that matched his own and he felt much gratitude to Lee. When he became president, he named his defender United States Consul to Morocco. It was a vacation appointment, which Lee was very glad to accept. 
He left the country for his post, only to find that he left a storm behind him. His wife had a younger sister, co-heiress, to her father's estate. In some way, Henry Lee became enamored of her and had been guilty of misconduct with her. The ugly facts apparently had been whispered about and perhaps had caused Henry Lee to be socially ostracized, but they had led to no public reprisals. Now, when Jackson submitted his name for confirmation by the Senate on February 3, 1830, an open fight was made on him. As he had already admitted some items of the charge, no defense was made. Every senator who cast a ballot voted against him, among them his longtime friend and college mate, John Tyler. The whole of the scandal became common knowledge in March, 1830. Henry Lee had to leave his post and after a stay in Italy, removed to Paris, where he was to live until his death, seven years later. This affair must have been an intense humiliation to Lieutenant Lee. Much as he had cherished the memory of his father, he could not have been ignorant of Light Horse Harry's financial reputation, and now to have his father's name disgraced by the son who bore it was to add the blush of shame to the ruddy complexion of the young engineer. So far as is known, he never referred in later life to his half-brother, though he possessed and doubtless studied the one volume that Black Harry issued in 1837 of a projected life of Napoleon. Significantly, Robert Lee failed, in later years, to name any one of his three sons Henry, perhaps in the belief that to do so would be to revive the scandal. Doubtless as he read by the candle of his crude quarters on Cockspur Island the story of his brother's misdeeds, he was strengthened in his resolution to efface by his own conduct the blot on the proud scutcheon of the Lees. Such things in a man's life are not to be proved by citation or confirmed by footnotes, but there is every reason to believe that the stern morality of Robert Lee was stiffened by the warning of his brother's fall. In exactly the same way, the rigid exactness of the son in all money matters, small and large, was a reaction from his father's laxness. Chapter 6. Marriage By the time summer and mosquitoes came in 1830, the embankment at Cockspur Island had been thrown over part of the island and the drainage canal had been dug. Because of the weather and the insect pests, the work was then suspended, and most of the force left the island. Lee went home, that is, he went to visit among friends who lived close enough to Arlington for him to go there often to see Mary Custis. He found Mrs. Custis not unsympathetic. She was his kinswoman, she was young enough to be interested in romance, of which she read much, and she was one of those rare persons in whose presence every honest man felt at ease. Mr. Custis, however, was not pleased at the frequent appearance of the same horseman in the park at Arlington. To be sure, Mr. Custis had nothing against Robert Lee personally, but he knew the financial tragedy of the Lee family and was aware that his daughter's admirer had very little beyond his pay as second lieutenant. He did not welcome the idea that his only child was interested in a man who could not support her as she was accustomed to live. If Lee knew of Custis's opposition, he did not let it deter him. When Mary journeyed down to Chatham, her mother's former home on the Rappahannock, Robert appeared there also, and while sitting with her under a great tree on the lawn, he talked to her of those gentle themes that make any suitor eloquent. Below him stretched the Rappahannock, across it were the spires of the sturdy little town of Fredericksburg, and beyond the town a line of hills, one of them forest-covered, another crowned with a mansion in the style of the Grecian Revival. Soldier though he was, he would have shuddered to think that a day would come when he would stand atop one of those distant hills and, through the battle smoke, search with his field glasses for a glimpse of that very tree. In company so delightful, with so absorbing a siege to engross him, the summer of 1830 passed far too rapidly for Lieutenant Lee of the Engineers, and the call to return to Cockspur Island came all too soon. He left New York on the packet for Savannah and arrived at his station on the night of November 10th. He found a situation from which a timid young man would have been glad to run away. Major Babcock had not arrived. Lee was the only engineer on the ground. A recent gale had broken the embankment erected during the previous winter and spring. Across the mouth of the canal that drained the ditches on the site of the fort, the embankment had been entirely swept away. The canal itself was choked. The wharf was in such condition that repair seemed impossible. It was Lee's duty to take hold at once and to resume the work with the help of the few men who had remained on the island during the summer. 
By the 1st of December, Lee had replaced enough of the embankment to keep the water off that part of the island on which the fort was to be erected, but he proceeded to strengthen this barrier so that the next storm would not beat it down or breach it. When this was completed, he planned to clean out the canal leading to the ditches. About a month later, word came that Major Babcock had resigned. In his place, as superintendent, Lieutenant J. K. F. Mansfield was sent to Cockspur. He was a man four years Lee's senior, had graduated number two in the class of 1822, and already had to his credit some solid service in the construction of Fort Hamilton, New York Harbor. The assignment of Mansfield to Cockspur Island was almost in the nature of a life sentence, for he continued in charge, with temporary duty on various other engineering projects until 1846. Young Mansfield was a pleasant companion, but, of course, he could not enliven Cockspur Island. So, as often as he could, Lee slipped up the river to Savannah and enjoyed the gay company of his friends. The family of Isaac Minnies gave him cordial welcome, made the more delightful by the presence of two daughters, Sarah and Philippa. Jack McKay had been sent to a post in Alabama and, needless to say, was greatly missed, but the fine old house on Broughton Street was hardly less attractive on that account. Margaret McKay, as charming as her name, had married Ralph E. Elliot, but there remained Catherine and Eliza. And Eliza was captivating, so captivating that the young lieutenant from Cockspur found some consolation in her presence for his long separation from the blonde girl at Arlington. Joseph Mansfield had not long been on duty when he concluded that the original plan was not adapted to the site and that a new design would have to be prepared. Captain Delafield was summoned as consultant on the changes and arrived in April, 1831. Before that date, however, it was apparent that the work would have virtually to be suspended for a season. This, of course, would involve the partial idleness of Lee, and that was no light matter to the Bureau. The Corps of Engineers then had more contracts at other locations than the limited personnel could supervise. Although the chief engineer had often appealed for the enlargement of his force, Congress had failed to act, and the different enterprises had been divided, as far as practicable, among the officers. In only four instances did the supervising engineer have another officer of the Corps as his assistant. On the other projects, the assistants were civilians. In these circumstances, needless to say, a lieutenant could not be kept unemployed at Cockspur Island. Lee had been expecting an assignment to Old Point, Virginia, and sometime before April, he received orders directing him to proceed thither. He would have been altogether delighted but for the prospect of separation from the friends in Broughton Street. He was not in love with Eliza McKay and she had suitors enough and to spare, but he was much her cavalier and perhaps he flirted a bit with her. When no letters came from her, he professed himself afflicted. When he should go away, well, he gallantly and teasingly wrote of her missives, I don't know what I shall do for them at old point. But you will send me some sometimes, will you not, sweet? How I shall besiege the P. office. He was sorry that he might be denied a farewell to the family, which at the time was visiting near Beaufort, S.C., perhaps, he wrote Eliza, owing to Captain Delafield's arrival I shall be obliged to stay longer. Perhaps I can get to Beaufort. Perhaps your two weeks will be out next Tuesday. Perhaps I shall be taken sick. But no desired malady added to his jest. His moving orders were acknowledged on April 21st, and he had to say au revoir. He remained for the whole of his life a close friend of the McKays and their children. Mansfield he was to meet again on numerous occasions and, at the last, was to face him at Sharpsburg, where Mansfield fell at the head of his corps of infantry, attempting to storm Lee's position. When Lee reported at Hampton Roads on May 7, 1831, much of the labor on Fort Monroe itself had been completed, and the place was occupied by a garrison, but the outworks and the approaches had not been constructed. His was the necessary but uninspiring task of computing costs, ordering supplies, and directing men in hauling earth, in grading, and in excavating the ditch that was to surround the fort. A little later he had to supervise the masons who erected a wall on the outer side, or counterscarp, of the ditch, which was exposed to the tide from the nearby waters of Mill Creek. Out in Hampton Roads, less than a mile offshore from Old Point, was Fort Calhoun, later known as Fort Wool. This work had been started on riprops, or stones placed in deep waters, to serve as a foundation. 
The walls were rising to the level of the second battery not long after Lee's arrival, but there was a dangerous subsidence, which showed the futility of immediate attempts to build higher. Thereafter, and for the whole of Lee's stay in Hampton Roads, when any work at all was done at Fort Calhoun, it was that of unloading and distributing stone, so as to bring to bear on the foundations as great a weight as they would have to carry when the walls were completed. Life at Fort Monroe, from the very outset, was mixed pleasure and controversy. The commander of the fort was Brevet Colonel Abram Eustace, who was then 44, a native Virginian, well-schooled at Harvard. He and the engineers were not friendly. Lee's immediate superior was Captain Andrew Talcott, who was in charge of the construction at both forts. Talcott was a native of Connecticut, 10 years older than Lee, and had graduated number two in the class of 1818 at West Point. Nearly the whole of his professional career, up to the time Lee joined him, had been spent in building fortifications. He was capable, careful, and considerate of his subordinate, and he speedily won the fullest respect of his new assistant. The year after Lee came to Fort Monroe, Talcott married Harriet Randolph Hackley, a lovely Virginia girl of high blood, with a fine coloring, brown eyes, a graceful figure, and a manner of much attractiveness. Her picture in oils, by Thomas Sully, is one of the finest of early American portraits. Lee, who was only three years her senior, admired Mrs. Talcott most extravagantly, both for herself and also because she was a cousin of the young mistress of Arlington. He played faithful courtier to her, with much gaiety and jest. The Talcotts continued to be Lee's closest friends at Fort Monroe, and they brightened the life of the post for him. There were, in addition, 31 artillery officers on the station, for Fort Monroe was the artillery school of the army, and at that time had six companies of gunners in garrison. Among these officers, Lee found three of the men with whom he had been at West Point, John Kennedy of his own class, Dick Tillman of the class of 1828, and James H. Prentice, who had graduated the year after Lee had left. With these he was on easy terms, and with the others he quickly had camaraderie. His social charm, his abounding physical cheer, and his consideration of others made this easy. It was noticed that he never had anything disparaging to say of his fellow officers, a habit that was as attractive as it was unusual among soldiers who had overmuch leisure. Already Lieutenant Lee was a devotee of military promptness. If he must lay siege to a heart, he would do it with as little delay as he would countenance in investing a city. So, very soon after he returned from Georgia, and perhaps before he reported for duty at Fort Monroe, he took steamer up the Potomac to visit Miss Custis, who was much more interested in him than a young lady of her generation in Virginia would ever let a gentleman know. Mrs. Custis watched with sympathy, though the master of Arlington still frowned. One day soon after his arrival, he was in the hall of Arlington House, reading aloud to Mary and to Mrs. Custis from a new novel of Sir Walter Scott's. The interest of the narrative and of the audience was such that Robert kept on until his weariness must have been apparent to Mrs. Custis. Mary, she said, at a pause in the reading, Robert must be tired and hungry, go into the dining room and get him some lunch. Miss Custis obediently rose, and Robert, excusing himself, followed her. At the sideboard, she stooped to get her guest a piece of fruit cake. Robert leaned forward too, and then and there the question was put and answered. If he ate his fruit cake, it was with a happy heart. Mr. Custis reluctantly gave his consent to a marriage his daughter was old enough to contract on her own account. The nuptials were set for June 30, and the place, of course, was to be Arlington, with bridesmaids and groomsmen in a number becoming so important an event. Robert was to get a furlough for as long a time as he could, and when the festivities were over and the furlough had expired, the two were to live at Fort Monroe, live on his pay, as other young couples did, without any help from Mr. Custis. Mary was determined on that. There followed many gay preparations, not least of which was Mary's choice of six bridesmaids, among her cousins. Robert called upon a corresponding number of his friends to support him in the hour when the bravest man trembles. The desired furlough was procured through the friendly help of Captain Talcott. Arlington, which usually wore a somewhat neglected look, was put in order for the great day. The attendants arrived early and, of course, were all housed at the bride's home. Catherine Mason, a neighborhood friend of Mary's since childhood, was the counterpart of the present-day maid of honor, though a more courteous age gave equal honor to all. 
Her escort, Robert's best man, was naturally his brother Smith, who was almost as handsome as Robert and of fine, cordial manners. Next was Mary Goldsboro, a cousin of the brides on Custicide. With her stood Lieutenant John P. Kennedy, Robert's classmate and now a lieutenant of the 1st Artillery, stationed at Old Point. Miss Marietta Turner had as her cavalier, Lieutenant James A. Chambers, somewhat older than the rest of the bridal party, and a friend of Robert's days at Coxborough Island. Miss Angela Lewis, still another cousin of the Custis stock, was entrusted to Lieutenant Richard Tillman, familiarly dick to all West Pointers and to all the officers at Fort Monroe. Miss Julia Calvert, who was of the Lord Baltimore stock of G.W. P. Custis's mother, was in the chivalrous care of Lieutenant James H. Prentice, who had come up with the others from Old Point to hearten his comrade. The other bridesmaid was Mary's cousin, Britannia Peter, of Georgetown across the Potomac, a kinswoman who was to prove her loyalty to the Lees at a time when the very name of Arlington connoted woe. Her gallant was Thomas Turner, cousin of the grooms on his mother's side. While the guests were assembling on June 30, 1831, a heavy downpour of rain swept over the country around Arlington. Through it, at length, Reverend Ruel Keith, the officiating clergyman, arrived on horseback, drenched and dripping, in no condition assuredly to stand on the floor of the drawing room at Arlington, amid young officers in full dress uniform, much less in the presence of young women apparelled in all the glory of two states and of the District of Columbia, besides. There was nothing to do except to provide Mr. Keith with dry clothes. But whose could they be? The soldiers had only their uniforms, Mr. Custis was the sole civilian on the place with an extra pair of breeches available. And Mr. Custis was short and of unequal proportions, whereas the reverend gentleman was as tall as a grenadier and as thin as an anchorite. Into Mr. Custis's clothes, however, the clergyman had to step, to the high amusement of those who aided him in effecting the change. The other guests were cheated of the sight of an angular parson in the garb of a small aristocrat, because when Mr. Keith put on a cassock and surplice, they hid the folds and concealed the shortness of his garments. All was ready. The bridal party marched into the drawing-room, which is the chamber on the right as one enters Arlington from the portico. Mary was nervous, Robert was pale, but noted mentally that he was not so excited as he thought he should have been. He felt very much as if he were at the blackboard at West Point waiting to recite a problem. The minister, Lee confided later to his friend Captain Talcott, had few words to say, though he dwelt upon them as if had been reading my death warrant, and there was a tremulousness in the hand I held that made me anxious for him to end. The wedding party remained at Arlington in festivity and merriment until the following Tuesday, July 5, when the young officers, their leaves ending or their endurance failing, were forced to say goodbye. Some of the bridesmaids, being of more durable social fiber, lingered until the end of the week. Then the young lovers were left alone for a day or two, with no company save that of Mr. and Mrs. Custis. But it was not for long. Robert rode over to Washington on Monday, July 11, got all the news of the engineering office, and on his way probably stopped at Alexandria in order to make some purchases for the quarter at Fortress Monroe. The next day, or the day after, he and his bride, accompanied by Mrs. Custis, went to Ravensworth on the first leg of a journey to visit Randolph and Lewis Kinn in Fauquier and Loudoun counties. As he appeared on his honeymoon, Robert was blissfully happy and seemed already to bear unconsciously the air of a man destined to achievement. I looked up, a cousin wrote of his appearance that fall, and my eye fell upon his face in perfect repose, and the thought at once flashed through my mind, you certainly look more like a great man than anyone I have ever seen. In love and merriment, with much jest and teasing, the days ran rapidly on, but he did not forget his duties at Fort Monroe. He was to return early in August, and to the letter which he wrote Captain Talcott about the wedding he added this postscript, they are talking around me at such a rate that I hardly know what I have written and despair of reading it. But please send the boat out for me, the first trip the steamboat Potomac makes in August. Lee's marriage to Mary Custis was one of the major influences that shaped his career. Although she was not often able to travel far or to share the hardships of an engineer's life on a frontier project, she bore him seven children in fourteen years. Ahead of her lay invalidism more nearly complete and more pitiful than that of Lee's mother. Like her father she was careless in her personal apparel to the point of untidiness, until, late in life, she found a maid who took pride in dressing her attractively. 
Rising from one illness, she found her hair in such a tangle that she impulsively took the scissors and cut it off. Her domestic management was complimented when it was termed no worse than negligent. In her engagements she was forgetful and habitually late, an aggravating contrast to the minute promptness of her husband. Once when her husband was expecting guests, a few years after their marriage, he apologized frankly in advance. Tell the ladies, he wrote, that they are aware that Mrs. L. is somewhat addicted to laziness and forgetfulness in her housekeeping. But they may be certain she does her best, or in her mother's words the spirit is willing but the flesh is weak. Despite these early shortcomings and later a nervous whimsicality that sometimes puzzled him, she held the love of Robert Lee through life. His fondness for the company of pretty women, which was always strong, never led him away from her or involved him in any sort of scandal. Ministering, rather than ministered unto, his first thought always was of her. She accepted this as her due from Mr. Lee as she called him, and even after the war between the states, when he was a demigod in the eyes of the South, she ordered him about. Yet rarely was a woman more fully a part of her husband's life. This, fundamentally, was because of his simplicity and her fineness of spirit. She was interested in people and in their happiness. A keen, if uncritical, interest in public affairs she retained all her days, nor did she hesitate to differ from Lee and to voice a fiery opinion in plain-spoken terms when his sense of justice and his reserve alike disposed him to say little. She loved wildflowers and old gardens and evening skies. Religion she had, of the same sort as that which her husband developed. They talked to each other of religion as neither talked on that subject to others, and she kept her faith in the triumph of the things in which she believed. A certain quick and understanding sympathy was shown in her kindling eye and ready smile. Her alertness made friends and brought admiring attention. She was wholly without personal ambition beyond that of sharing in the experiences and confidences of her friends. Although she was never awed by his presence, she had for his character a respect that became in time a positive reverence. It is futile to speculate on whether she ever shared what some are fond of terming the inmost secrets of a great man's heart. He had no such secrets, for in age as in youth he was always objective in mind. Loving her, he saw her best qualities, not her worst. Next after binding him to her in deepest spiritual love, perhaps her greatest influence on him was that she strengthened his self-control, because, as her health became impaired, she required much care at his hands. They needed all the love and all the faith and all the self-mastery they could develop, for they were to endure more of tragedy than is measured out to most mortals. It was fortunate they could not see ahead in that dreamy summer of 1831 when there were kisses and confidences and the happy freedom of youth. When Lee married Mary Custis, he married Arlington as well, and that, too, was to have a profound influence upon him. The estate was to bring much harassment of spirit, but it was to deepen his reverence for the Washington tradition. Mr. Custis himself was, of course, the nearest link with the first president. Many of the Washington relics were at Arlington, the portraits, the lantern from the Hall of Mount Vernon, the china presented by the Society of the Cincinnati, which probably had been ordered by Lee's own father, Washington's bookcase, his camp equipment, even some of the clothes he had worn, and the bed on which he had died. Mrs. Washington's Negro maid, Caroline Branham, who had been in the room on the December night when the great spirit of the nation's founder had passed, was among the servants at Arlington at the time of Mary Custis's wedding. To come into the atmosphere of Arlington was to Robert Lee almost like living in the presence of his foremost hero, his father's old commander. This marriage, wrote a kinsman biographer, in the eyes of the world, made Robert Lee the representative of the family of the founder of American liberty. Chapter 7 The Ancient War of Staff and Line Early in August, 1831, and doubtless on the first boat, as promised, Lee and his wife reached Fort Monroe. Their plain quarters in the fort had been set in order by the friendly Talcott. The furnishings were simple, with no feather beds or luxuries, for Mrs. Lee brought with her no independent fortune and accepted no financial help from her father. Within a few weeks of their arrival at Old Point occurred the most exciting incident of their three years' residence there. On August 23, Colonel Abram Eustace, the commanding officer of the fort, received word from the mayor of Norfolk that a menacing insurrection of slaves had broken out in Southampton County, 40 miles from the city, and that the Negroes had procured arms and were mustering in large numbers. 
Help was needed. Eustace at once prepared three of his five companies of artillery for the field. The warships Warren and Natchez, then in Hampton Roads, also supplied detachments. Setting out the next morning and using water transportation for a part of the distance, the force was able to cover 60 miles in 24 hours. It found, most fortunately, that the rising had been put down and that the Negroes had been scattered. Nearly 60 white people, however, had been slain. As a staff officer, Lee did not go to Southampton, but he was, of course, profoundly concerned over the outburst and believed, on the basis of what he heard, that only the Negro's misunderstanding of the date of the rising prevented much mischief. He wrote Mrs. Custis, It is ascertained that they used their religious assemblies, which ought to have been devoted to better purposes, for forming and maturing their plans, and that their preachers were the leading men. The whole number of blacks taken and killed did not amount to the number of whites murdered by them. The insurrection had a thousand repercussions. Apprehension spread throughout the South. In Richmond the concern was so acute that Major Worth, Lee's old commander at West Point, who was then in garrison at Fort Monroe, was sent on a special journey to Bologna Arsenal to see that the arms stored there were secure against seizure. At Old Point, as a measure of precaution, Colonel Eustace put into effect a series of regulations for the exclusion of Negroes from the post. This greatly embarrassed the engineers and increased the long-developing friction that was to lead to a post-war between them and the colonel. The temper of some of the Negroes in the Tidewater section of Virginia was considered so menacing that five additional companies of artillery, three of the 3rd Regiment and two of the 4th, were brought to Fort Monroe and put on duty. This gave the fort a garrison of 680 men, no small part of the Army of the United States. The troops were not needed to suppress any further insurrection, but the presence of their officers added to the social life of the fort. To none was their advent more welcome than to Lee, for among the lieutenants who came with the artillery was his companion of West Point days, Joseph E. Johnston. The two took up where they had left off at the academy and seemingly were having a joyous time when their fellowship was interrupted by the Christmas holidays. The Lees went up the James River, probably to visit the Carters of Shirley, and then journeyed to Arlington via Baltimore, where they spent some snowy days with Mrs. Marshall. Soon after they got to Arlington they received a belated invitation to the wedding of the fair Eliza McKay to William H. Stiles, a Georgian of distinction. Lee sat down to write his good wishes and congratulations in a letter which was broken off more than once by the comings and goings of guests. He began the letter on her wedding day. How I should like to say Mr. and Mrs. Lee have the honor to accept Mrs. McKay's kind invitation for Wednesday night. But this cannot be Miss Eliza, my sweetheart, because it only arrived here last night, by this token that I have been in tears ever since at the thought of losing you. Oh me! Gilderoy, you are a lucky fellow to have got so bright a New Year's gift this January 1832. Why, man, it is better for you than the gift of life. But Miss E, how do you feel about this time? Say twelve o'clock of the day, as you see the shadows commence to fall towards the east and know that at last the sun will set? Though you may not be frightened, I expect you are most marvelously alarmed. Well, I do wish I could be there. It would do me so much good to be with you all again and see you so happy. I wonder it has never entered the dull heads of Congress that I ought to be there and that they ought to make special provision for the occasion. But the wretches take no care of U.S. youth. And through their negligence you are deprived of my presence and I of your sweet company. If I could but drop in this morning and tell you what a powerful fine thing it is to stand up before the parson with all eyes bent on you, except one pair, he mournful and solemn as if he were reading your funeral service. A man feels of so much, and I am sure, he could not add to the stillness of the scene though he were dead. Would not this revive you, Miss E? When he picked up the letter four days later, he was in the same merry mood. And how did you disport yourself, my child? Did you go off well, like a torpedo cracker on Christmas morning? Oh mercy, are you really married, Mrs. Stiles? The idea of it is as great a damper to a man's spirit as that of the cholera. But it must feel mighty funny to you. And I suppose you are so busy that you will not have time to read this scrawl, so I must think about bringing it to an end. After which he trailed off into chatter about mutual acquaintances in the army. Mrs. Lee added her congratulations in a postscript that presents most charmingly the contrast between her temperament and Lee's. 
You see what a small space has left me my dear Miss Eliza to offer my congratulations and to wish that your pathway in life may be as bright as our beneficent creator and father sees best for you. I still indulge a hope, though it may seem a vain one, that we may one day meet with a friend to us both so dear. I am now a wanderer on the face of the earth and know not where we are going next and hope it will be east. I suppose you remain in Savannah near your mother? What happiness! I am with mine now, the past and the future disregarded. I offer my love and congratulations to you and the family on the late joyous occasion. We should have been delighted to participate in it, so farewell. Your sincere and affectionate. M. Lee. Apparently Mrs. Lee remained at Arlington after the Christmas holidays and Lee went back to Old Point. He and Joe Johnston had a merry season. Johnston, still the colonel to his intimates, was impregnable in his self-discipline. Lee neither drank nor swore nor gambled. But if the pair walked not in the counsel of the ungodly, they had no compunctions about standing in the way of sinners, at least to see what the sinners were doing. When good man Eustace was safe behind the door of his quarters, quiet for the night, Lee and Johnston would prowl about, visiting the just and the unjust, with observant eye. On one call, they found a friend, as Lee wrote Jack McKay, in the middle of the floor, trying to get off his uniform. We had to assist his lendings, or borrowings rather, for there was nothing his own but his pants, and he had slept in the Colorado's uniform. There was no reproach in this, no shocked sensibilities. It was always so with Lee in his youth. He did not share in the excesses of his comrades, but he did not wear a somber face. When hard duty was given them, Lee shared their distress and understood how they might seek solace in their cups. The poor devils of subs, Lee confided to McKay, are drilled off their feet. This may have been the reason that one of the young officers kept as his constant companion, that file of Texas whiskey, hermetically sealed to celebrate his meeting with Dick Tillman whenever that should take place. As for Tillman himself, companion of West Point, he left yesterday for Baltimore, cursing the whole concern. Subsequently, Lee had to report that Johnston from occasionally accompanying me over the river is in some danger of being caught by a pair of black eyes. Mrs. Lee returned with milder weather, the nightly visitation of quarters by the engineer and the artillerist became less frequent, the scare of a slave rebellion subsided, most of the officers slipped back into the leisurely routine of life at an army post. But for Lee and his brothers, there opened a new and a strange warfare, a warfare that brought all the sons of Light Horse Harry closer together. Even the exiled and disgraced Black Horse Harry emerged from the shadows as a defender of the family name. The circumstances were odd, except for one period of wavering, Light Horse Harry Lee had been consistently opposed to Jeffersonian ideas. Charles Lee, his brother, had been Attorney General under Washington and of counsel in the famous case of Marbury v. Madison. The whole politics of the family was anti-Jefferson, though Jefferson was their distant kinsman through the Randolphs. Because of Henry Lee's part in procuring from his pen a statement regarding the character of a lady to whom Jefferson was alleged to have made improper advances, the Lees had long felt a certain contempt for the third president. There had been no open hostilities, however, until the appearance in 1829 of T. J. Randolph's four-volume edition of Jefferson's Correspondence. This contained two unpleasant references to Light Horse Harry. One was the statement in a letter of 1815 from Jefferson to Monroe, asserting that although the legislature of Virginia had absolved Jefferson of all blame for the seizure of public arms by the British at Richmond in January, 1781, General Lee has put all these imputations among the romances of his historical novel, Lee's Memoirs of the War in the Southern Department, for the amusement of credulous and uninquisitive readers. The other reference was in a letter to Washington, written at the time of the neutrality agitation. In this Jefferson branded Lee for repeating to Washington a tale that Jefferson had insinuated Washington was under Britain influence. It was, said he, the slander of an intriguer, dirtily employed in sifting the conversations of my table, where alone he could hear of me, and seeking to atone for sins against another who had never done him any other injury than of declining his confidence. Lee, the talebearer, he concluded, was a miserable tergiversator, who ought indeed to have been of more truth, or less trusted by his country. These references greatly incensed the Lees. 
the younger Henry had been at Monticello, at the invitation of its master, only three days before Jefferson's death, to examine papers which Jefferson held were absolution of any charge of mismanagement of Virginia's affairs in 1781, and now Henry Lee took up the chapter in his exile and wrote a tedious but terrific indictment of Jefferson under the title Observations on the Writings of Thomas Jefferson, with particular reference to the attack they contain on the memory of the late general. Henry Lee. This appeared in 1832. The thesis of the book was that Jefferson had been guilty of the duplicity that Lee had charged against him. The conduct of the two men during and after the revolution was compared in an effort to show how much better Lee had behaved than Jefferson. The author attempted to prove that Jefferson had maligned others, Washington, Hamilton, Knox, Marshall, and Jay, as he had maligned Lee. It was a savage, bitter, and wordy book, but it showed the intensity of the family's devotion to the memory of Light Horse Harry. In reaction, Lee and his brothers became more confirmed in their opposition to the party of Jefferson. By inheritance, Robert Lee was a Federalist, by circumstance he became a Whig, wholly out of sympathy with the party that controlled the government during the greater part of his service in the United States Army. Carter Lee was as bitter against Jefferson as Henry was, and in 1839 he issued a second and even more elaborate edition of the Observations, with new criticism of his father's assailant. The whole ran to 262 closely printed pages. Robert's temperament was not one to indulge in vendettas, and his name does not appear in the controversy, but he was as zealous as any of his brothers in upholding the public record of his father, and then, as always, he regarded his father as a hero who had fallen on misfortune. Despite this affair, Robert Lee's spirits were high during most of 1832, and his new domestic life was most happy. Mrs. Lee was sick part of the time, and was often away, but she bore him a fine baby on September 16, 1832. The youngster was named George Washington Custis Lee, after his grandfather, and he throve despite childish ills. Lee joked with his mother on occasion, mercy, what gets into women's heads, but he told McKay, I would not be unmarried for all you could offer me. As for the baby, he confessed in due course, Master Custis is the most darling boy in the world. Now that he was pater familius, the company of the wives of the officers at Old Point interested him vastly. I am left to console them, he said of the women whose husbands were sent south in the Seminole War, and am in the right position to sympathize with them, as Mrs. Lee and her little limb are at Arlington. And again, as for the daughters of Eve in this country, they are formed in the very poetry of nature, and would make your lips water and fingers tingle. They are beginning to assemble to put their beautiful limbs into this salt water. The news of expectancy and of birth found in him an amused and enthusiastic chronicler. The population of the point, he announced to McKay, has been increased by the little huger boy, and I take it upon myself to predict the arrival of a small French. The coming of a new Talcott baby drew from him congratulations and avowals, the first of numerous such messages that he was to send, I was sincerely delighted yesterday to learn by your note, of the magnificent present offered you by Mrs. T, and had some thought of taking the barge this morning and presenting my congratulations to Mrs. T, in person do offer them in my stead in the kindest manner. We have been waiting for the event to decide upon the sex of our next and now determine it shall be a girl in order to retain the connection in the family. The joke was made the more pointed by the fact that the next was begotten soon thereafter and, sure enough, was a girl. For the company he kept, Lee's inclination and his disciplined neatness disposed him to wear handsome, well-cut clothing. He got himself a dress uniform coat, made by the fashionable tailor at the military academy, and he thriftily calculated the difference in cost between purchasing a new chapeau and buying new trimmings for his old one. We shall be a grand set of fellows with our gold and silver, he said, and if I could only catch some of the grandiloquence of my neighbor Fabius, Whiting, I might hope to rise in the world. It probably was about this time, or perhaps in 1831, that Lee sat for the first of his portraits. Reproduced in this volume, it shows him in the full-dress uniform of his corps, with the side-whisker that was the dernier CRI of fashion. Then, as in later life, he preferred the company of women to that of men, but even when Talcott was away from Old Point, had a number of able men beside Johnston with whom to consort. Benjamin Huger, West Pointer of 1824, James Barnes of his own class, Robert Parrott, who had been an assistant professor while Lee was at the academy, and Albert E., Church of the Class of 1828, all of them brilliant, were at Old Point during Lee's service there. 
these friends sufficed. Beyond the social life of the fort, Lee had little diversion at Old Point and seemingly craved none. He kept up a rather extensive correspondence, he played some chess, and, for the first time, became interested in his Lee ancestry and coat of arms. In the better mastery of his profession, these years were a busy and a most important period with Lee. He came as an assistant of limited experience, he was to leave fully qualified to direct a large engineering project. Talcott was absent on other duty for part of the building season of 1832 and for virtually all the seasons of 1833 and 1834. The daily burden of the work rested on Lee. At Fort Monroe the counter scarp wall was finished, the scarp wall was pointed, and a considerable part of the casemate covert way was arched by August, 1832, when cholera broke out and forced Talcott, who was then on duty, to suspend operations. Slave owners became alarmed for the safety of their servants and would not hire them in adequate numbers. The arches, however, were finished before the season ended. Labor continued scarce during 1833, despite an increase of 15% in wages. Some painting and a good deal of carpenter work was done, but progress was not so rapid as had been hoped. It was nearly December before enough workers were at hand to resume labor on the ramparts, and thereafter they had to be laid off in a little more than two weeks because of the damage done by a heavy storm. At the beginning of the season of 1834 Lee left Arlington before the Potomac was opened and rode overland to Fort Monroe, up to my ears in mud and alone. He went to work as soon as he could assemble his force of laborers and, undeterred by another heavy storm that wrecked several vessels in Hampton Roads, he got an extensive season's program underway. When the project was nearing completion, uncertainty concerning further appropriations threatened to force a discharge of the laborers, but this was averted for the time. Very little work was undertaken at Fort Calhoun, despite President Jackson's desire to have it completed before the expiration of his term. The unobliging foundations continued at the rate of three inches a year. All that could be done was to continue to pile up stone in the hope that the substratum would be so compressed that it would carry the weight of the walls. Lee bore these responsibilities heavily, but he continued to learn. He did some designing of buildings, wharves, and fortifications, he supervised the preparation of accounts and of monthly and annual reports, he faced some of the problems of sanitation, with which the science of his day was quite unable to cope, he had a large experience in estimating construction costs, he acquired a further knowledge of the working of the commissary, he was inducted into the mysteries of banking and departmental finance. The art of dealing with labor he acquired so successfully that, after an emergency in April, 1834, when all hands had been called out to build a barricade in a blinding blow of sand, hail, and rain, he had been able to say with pride, I never saw men work better. He learned, also, how to combine initiative with deference, and in nearly all his personal letters to Talcott there was a tactful line asking, if that officer thought him in error, to forward further instructions. Most particularly did he shine in applying to public works the principles of economy he had been taught at home. He bargained closely for schooner hire, and was uneasy when he thought the vessels did not carry so much as they should. His inspections of material were critical, his disposition was to seek the most favorable time for awarding contracts. When additional stone was needed at Fort Monroe he figured he could take the rough hewings at Fort Calhoun and dress them for not much more than half what the material would cost elsewhere. Lee liked the location of Fort Monroe and the companionship of many of the officers, and he felt that he would not readily find another such chief as Talcott. Vexations there were, however, some of them so galling that in 1833 he contemplated resigning from the army. No, my friend, he wrote McKay, that it is a situation full of pains, and one from which I shall modestly retire on the first fitting opportunity. My opinion on these matters has been formed, from the little experience I have had of a garrison life in time of peace, where I have seen minds formed for use and ornament, degenerate into sluggishness and inactivity, the stimulus of brandy or cards to rouse them to action, and apparently a burden to the possessors and perhaps an injury to their companions. The drinking in which some of the officers indulged in their idleness ceased to be taken as a matter of course and came to puzzle him. He is a fine-looking young man, he said of a lieutenant who had been arrested for being drunk on parade. Graduated very well in 1832 and appears to be intelligent, but his propensity, it is impossible for me to comprehend. 
He kept up with politics, yet he wearied of its perpetual discussion, Congress is doing nothing but hammering on the tariff and makes no mention of promoting modest merit in the persons of you and I. And again, there is nothing new here or in these parts. Nullification. 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 Besides all, promotion in the Engineers' Corps was incredibly slow, it had been 1832 before he had passed from brevet to regular rank as second lieutenant. But all these things were less of a burden to him than the constant jealousies and conflicts of authority between the staff and the line, between the engineers on one side and, on the other, the commandant at Fort Monroe. The line officers disliked the large liberty the engineers had to make contracts and to disperse public funds. Following the clash with Colonel Eustace in 1831 over the orders for the exclusion of Negroes from the fort, there had been several squabbles, and in one instance a controversy of some seriousness over the discharge of Lee's principal overseer because of a quarrel with a captain at the post. In this instance, junior officer though he was, Lee did not hesitate to express to headquarters his sympathy with the discharged man, who, he said, had been zealous and faithful in the discharge of his duties. Lee's differences, however, were incidental to a continuing feud between Captain Talcott and the line. This quarrel was over the engineers' use of quarters within the fort and, more hotly, over the direction by the engineers of the remaining work at Fort Monroe. Talcott thought the engineers should complete the whole enterprise. The officers of the garrison wished it finished by the troops and laborers at the fort. Each side suspected the other of plotting against it. Early in 1834 the artillery school of practice at Fort Monroe was broken up and its officers and batteries were ordered to different stations. The engineers regarded this as a victory, though they had no part in compassing it. Lee rejoiced that the Cincinnati, as he put it, were called from their plows to their swords. The number of idlers, in the eyes of the busy engineers, was graciously reduced. Of course, this involved separation from Joe Johnston, and that was lamentable, especially in the circumstances. For when the artillery officers were ordered from Old Point they were put aboard the Alabama, and there they remained, indefinitely, as it seemed. Having nothing to do, and never having had any work, as Lee maintained, the board artillerists arranged a grand party. They did not invite the wives of the officers of the garrison or the young aristocrats of Hampton Roads. Instead, they summoned to the ship the ladies of easy virtue in the neighborhood. If they had to be caged in that confounded ship, forever rolling and pitching in the wintry sea, the gunners would at least have one great evening, with merriment unrestrained. High preparations were made in galley and in cabin, eagerly the young officers awaited the arrival of the Circes. They came not. At last, when an explanation was had, it was distressful, in order to tune themselves up for the evening the expected guests had indulged themselves in a little spirits and, most deplorably, had become too drunk for the journey. Johnston had no part in this, except perhaps as a spectator aboard the ship, but it was a flat anticlimax to the residents at Old Point of officers who had given gaiety to day and noise to night. If the engineers rejoiced when the disappointed artillerists at last sailed away, their satisfaction was brief. Congress adjourned during the last week of June and, among its final acts, confirmed all the brevet commissions in the army as regular grades. The exultation of the artillerists who remained at Fort Monroe aroused Lee's amusement and almost his disgust. Then, on July 18, though the regular inspection had already been made, Major General Alexander Macomb, the commanding officer of the army, came to Fort Monroe with the Secretary of War and examined the work being done at Old Point and at the Rip-Raps. He said little about his findings, but went back to Washington and filed a report. Of its contents Talcott and Lee knew nothing at the time, though they attributed to Macomb the general hostility that line officers were supposed to feel toward the staff. Six days later the Inspector General of the Army, Colonel John E. Wool, arrived at the fort to examine the works. Talcott happened to be absent in Norfolk at the time, so Lee had to do the honors. When he waited on Wool for that purpose, the colonel asked if it were not a fact that General Macomb had recently made an inspection. As Lee confirmed this without comment, Wool said that he saw no reason for going over the details of the work, but that, for his own information, he would like to see Fort Calhoun. Lee took him out to the rip-raps immediately. 
It was blistering hot, but Lee was determined, as he jestingly wrote Talcott, that the three inspections might complete our measure of glory for this work. On the way, Wolf propounded several wise queries, and among them, whether there were not quarters for us outside, which, said Lee, I take for a premonitory symptom. Wool did nothing further that day and on the following morning merely walked on the ramparts with Lee for a time before breakfast. That was all there was to inspection number three, but by no means all the story. On July 31st the adjutant general issued order number 54, received from the War Department. This stated that on the report of the Major General commanding the Army the Engineer Department in Hampton Roads should be transferred to the Ripraps and that the Commandant at Fort Monroe should be charged with the completion of the works at Old Point Comfort under directions and instructions from General Headquarters. Only one officer of engineers was to be left at Hampton Roads and he was to take up his quarters at the Ripraps with all his force by August 31st or earlier if convenient. As a special concession, so to speak, the engineers were to be allowed to get their water from the cisterns at Fort Monroe. The order concluded with a statement that it was understood no further appropriations were to be asked for Fort Monroe. It was hoped by a judicious application of unexpended balances and funds made available through the sale of surplus engineering property that Fort Monroe may be placed in a respectable condition both as to defense and appearance. When this order was received by Talcott, on August 5th, he considered it a direct censure of his management of the work in Hampton Roads, and he believed everyone else at Old Point so regarded it. He accordingly demanded a court of inquiry. Greshet promptly concurred in this demand, though he toned it down to a request in his covering letter to the Secretary of War. Macomb, however, did not approve of an investigation. For my part, he wrote, I cannot see that any censure is either expressed or implied in any part of the order from the War Department, and I am sure none was intended in the report on which it is founded. Macomb was justified in this statement because the report did not contain any criticism of Talcott. It was simply a statement that the work remaining to be done at Fort Monroe was comparatively unimportant in character and in extent and could easily be done by the garrison. The report stated wrongly that Talcott favored this arrangement, but Macomb gave the engineers full credit for the construction they had directed. The report, in a word, was unexceptionable, whatever the feeling that prompted it. The trouble was with the blunt, explicit language of the order from the adjutant general's office. Not realizing this, Lee went to Washington to see what lay behind the report and the order. Through the kindness of one of the assistant engineers, a West Pointer of his own day, Lee got a look at the correspondence and learned that a modification of the offending order was in prospect, with high compliments to Talcott. The engineer's workmen, however, were to go to the Ripraps, with Lee in charge, and Talcott was to be sent to the Hudson River to supervise improvements in contemplation there. It was all as you supposed got up by General M., Lee reported grimly to Talcott. A little later, Lee suspected that some other influence had been at work, though that did not lessen his resentment at what he considered to be the mistreatment of Talcott by Macomb. But now I think of it, he asked Talcott, is there no way of cooking Macomb up and that the scullions be so arranged that I could have one stir in the pot? He is a most precious veek and surely and obeys his instructions as well as another. Something must be done with him, but what can? The sentiments of the captain and of the lieutenant, as positive as insubordinate, did not reduce the immediate authority of the major general. Nor could the juniors foresee that in a little more than a year the offending order would be revoked and the authority of the engineers restored. For the time, the work was ended. Talcott received instructions to set out for the Hudson and Lee moved over to the poorly equipped Ripraps. He went there so much in advance of the design 31st of August that he wrote Talcott on that day he might be considered an old inhabitant. Despite his indignation at the political aspect of the matter, Lee did not regard the change at Fort Monroe as a reflection on himself or Talcott, or on their work, which he knew was creditable to them. For some time he had wished to get away from Old Point because of the bickering, and now that the line had triumphed over the staff, he philosophically viewed it as the triumph of animosity. I was heartily sick of it, he confided to McKay, and am rejoiced that it is at an end. The jealousy that existed concerning the contract exercised by the engineers was a continual thorn in my side. That the chief engineer did not consider the transfer of Talcott as a discredit to Lee was soon evident. 
At the riprap's, Lee's task was simply that of supervising the piling up of stone on the foundations, which still continued to sink just enough to make construction of the fort impossible. It was no work for a young and active man whose ability his chief in Washington had already discovered. About October 25, 1834, when he had been at the Riprap's only some two months, Lee received an invitation from General Gratiot to come to Washington. On his arrival, Gratiot told him that he was contemplating the transfer of Lieutenant Bartlett, an assistant in the office, and was considering Lee for the place. Lee, of course, was as anxious for his family to be near Arlington as he was to get away from Hampton Roads, but he frankly said he had no desire for office work. Greshet, however, was intent on having Lee, and he painted the prospect alluringly. Lee agreed, before he left, to try the work if Greshet desired him to do so. Shortly thereafter, he was relieved at Fort Calhoun by Captain W. Eliason and was ordered to report for service as assistant to the Chief of Engineers. Chapter 8 Lee is brought close to frustration. When Lee took his wife and little son from Fort Monroe to Arlington in November 1834, he expected to rent a house in Washington, but as he could not find suitable quarters, he decided to leave them at Arlington for the winter. And there they remained, as their children increased, during the whole of Lee's service in the national capital. It was an arrangement physically taxing on Lee, who rode to and from his office every day except in the very worst weather. For his family, it was the most pleasant of lives. Mary Custis's marriage did not make the least difference in her status at home, she remained the young mistress, the heiress to the estate. Her children were a delight to her parents. Mrs. Custis, whose warm heart, piety, and kindliness impressed Lee more and more as he lived at Arlington, watched ceaselessly over her daughter and her grandchild. Mary's father, George Washington Park Custis, who very soon abandoned his antagonism to her marriage, was an easygoing, indolent man, then fifty years of age. His features were sharp and irregular, his nose long and thin, and in after years his head was bald. A firmly set mouth and a well-rounded chin were his best features and indicated a firmness of character which his light blue and weak eyes seemed to contradict. His cheeks were slightly sunken and gave to his face a somewhat cadaverous appearance, which was hardly improved by the thin side whiskers he wore. He was careless with his dress, and the visitor to Arlington was often surprised at the shabby-appearing gentleman who appeared to welcome him to so splendid a mansion. Custis possessed considerable ability and could both speak and write with fluency and power, but he was at heart a dilettante. He had never been compelled to work, but he dabbled at the writing of drama, at poetry, at playing the violin, and, later in life, at painting. He was a good student of sound reading and no small culture, but he preferred the society of men to the company of books. All comers were welcome to the Arlington estate, rich and poor alike. At a large spring on the property he subsequently erected a kitchen and other buildings, threw open that part of the grounds to the public, and even went so far as to arrange for a small steamer to bring over the populace of Washington for picnics and frolics. Usually, he would come down from the mansion house to the spring, when a party was there, and would play with the children. As a planter Mr. Custis was not successful. Except for sheep raising, which he helped to promote in the United States, he had little interest in farming. He lived off the produce of properties that overseers or tenants operated, and his own Arlington he kept as a park. His servants were numerous and were fond of him, but otherwise they seemed to have been noted only for their laziness. The whole atmosphere of the place was friendly and leisured, but always slightly disordered and neglected. Although Mr. Custis professed to be a literator at the time of his daughter's marriage, he made no pretense to being a saint. He loved the larger world in which he had all too little a part, and when Washington theaters offered attraction Mr. Custis shook off his indolence and became an enthusiast. He was amusing himself, Carter Lee had written in 1829, with beholding and describing Madame Vester's dance. Her manner of saluting the audience particularly strikes him, and he expatiates upon the style with which she elevates her toe higher than her waist and points it deliberately at the spectators. When there was jovial company at Arlington, Custis threw most cheerfully into the entertainment, a little theatrically, perhaps, and with some self-consciousness, but hospitably and generously. At bottom, he was a sincere, kindly gentleman, and he soon had for Lee a respect and an affection that were cordially returned. 
the Washington tradition seeped more deeply into the spirit of Lee as he lived among the Arlington relics and heard Mr. Custis talk of the father of his country. Across the river he found traditions of another sort and a routine of labor that was pleasant only because his commanding officer made it so. In origin, Charles Gratiot, chief engineer of the army, was French Louisianian of the highest social station and had been one of the young men General Wilkinson had first selected as cadets at West Point when he had been sent out to win the goodwill of the people of Louisiana. With a brilliant career in the army Gratiot had received the thanks of Congress for his conduct during the War of 1812 and as chief engineer he had earned the reputation of being an indispensable officer, a model of the military virtues. His manners, attested one admirer, were as childlike, simple and unpretending as his talents were brilliant and cultivated. Every project aroused his interest. The welfare of each officer of engineers was his particular charge. Shortcomings on the part of his subordinates he was ready to overlook, their interests he was quick to defend against the rivalries of the line and the neglect of Congress. He had the warm goodwill of the Corps, and when Lee went to Washington, he seemed fully entrenched in power, well able to care for himself. It is useless to waste a man's good wishes on him inasmuch as he never requires them, Lee said, half admiringly, half in jest. He will seemingly knock his way through life. Lee had brought with him from Old Point the clerk who had carried the burden of his accounts and official papers there, and with this help he was able to dispose of the correspondence that Greshit turned over to him. The assistance of this experienced clerk was the more important because Lee complained that his own memory was bad, bad, it would appear, because he could not remember indefinitely every detail of each financial transaction. Besides correspondence, he was given some of the odd jobs of the office, the most important of them being the installation of a lithographic press. Although Lee usually hurried home in fair weather, he was quick to find his old friends and to enter again into their lives in the spirit of West Point or of Fort Monroe. Joe Johnston was on duty in Washington at the time and shared in Lee's social activities, with more restraint, however, than at Old Point. Under the shadow of the White House, Lee and Johnston had to be more circumspect than had been necessary when Colonel Eustace was in his quarters and the night was waning. One day Lee was riding along Pennsylvania Avenue when he hailed a brother officer on the sidewalk. Come, get up with me, Lee cried cheerily, and as his comrade was willing, the two proceeded together on the back of the astonished horse. Still most astonished was the Secretary of the Navy when he chanced to see the spectacle. If he informed his brother of the War Department of the undignified behavior of two officers of the Army, Lee heard nothing of it, despite numerous prophecies and much chaffing by his comrades. On nights when the weather was too inclement for the journey home or the roads were too heavy, Lee often joined a mess at Mrs. Ulrich's, a boarding house where Joe Johnston and James H. Prentice and other army men resided, together with one or two cabinet officers and a number of congressmen. It was a more expensive life than Lee's thrifty nature approved, and when a change in the army regulations reduced the allowance for rations, he vainly sought a transfer to another post. Except for this expense and the dull duties assigned him, Lee enjoyed the life of Washington and of the Arlington neighborhood. All his social impulses were aroused by it. Your humble servant, he confided to Talcott, has returned to a state of rejuvenescency and has attended some weddings and parties in a manner that is uncommon. My brother Smith was married on the fifth INST and the bride, I think, looked more beautiful than usual. We kept it going till Sunday, and last night I attended a bridal party in Alexandria. I will only tell, Mrs. Talcott, that my spirits were so buoyant last night, when relieved from the eyes of my dame, that my sister Nanny was trying to pass me off as her spouse, but I was not going to have my sport spoiled that way, undeceived the young ladies, and told them I was her younger brother. Sweet, innocent things, they concluded I was single and I have not had such soft looks and tender pressure of the hand for many years. Affairs of this nature were some compensation for a routine that made Lee exclaim, in the language of many a soldier of the same rank, what a pity it is a man is a poor lieutenant. Occasionally he gave a dinner, to which he invited some of his army friends. For one such affair, set at 4 p.m., he called five young officers. There will be one room devoted to the gentlemen, he wrote John McComb, and those who can sleep three in a bed will find comfortable accommodations. The round of office work was pleasantly broken in the spring of 1835. The boundary between Ohio and the territory of Michigan was then in dispute. An armed clash between the two neighbors seemed not unlikely. 
Talcott had previously been employed in making a survey of the line in controversy, and in May, 1835, he was directed to make new observations to answer the rival contentions. His old-time and able assistant, Lt. R. E. Lee of the Corps of Engineers, in that gentleman's own bantering announcement to Mrs. Talcott, will join him forthwith for same duty. The mission was not expected to take more than one month, but it occupied the entire summer. It involved a number of interesting calculations and it carried Lee to the Great Lakes, which he had never seen before. The tour of duty added little, however, to his equipment for the duties that lay ahead. Early in October, Lee got back to Washington and hastened on to Ravensworth, where the family was visiting. He found Mrs. Lee ill in bed. Her second baby, a girl, who had been named Mary, had been born that year. The mother unfortunately got a pelvic infection of some sort, which the physicians attributed to overexertion on her part. Lee regarded her condition as serious and he removed her to Arlington the day after his return. She suffered acutely until two abscesses that had formed on her groin broke. Then she began to mend, though very slowly. It was the beginning of 1836 before she was able to walk about again. The children got the whooping cough as their mother grew better, whooping, coughing, teething, etc., and sometimes all three together, in the language of the despairing father. Whereupon, Mrs. Lee, not to be outdone by her youngsters, contracted mumps. As the summer of 1836 came on, her improvement was more rapid. Lee then took her to one of the mineral springs of Virginia, where she was able to resume her normal life except for a slight lameness. When he brought her back in the autumn, he was himself much worn down by work and worry. I never saw a man so changed and saddened, a cousin recorded. Lee's duties during these difficult months confined him closely to the office of the chief engineer, with no outside assignment except one inspection at Fort Washington. He would have tried to escape from it, by prevailing on General Greshet to give him a post elsewhere, had Mrs. Lee's condition permitted him to leave her. Hearing all the department gossip and witnessing many of the controversies among his superior officers, he was drawn into the campaign to procure more consideration for the Engineers Corps at the hands of Congress. His efforts at lobbying, which were not very successful, deepened his dislike of politicians. Oh! We have been horribly, shamefully treated, he wrote Jack McKay. He was temporarily buoyed up a bit, later in the year, by interest in Texas's struggle for independence and by the promotion he tardily received on September 21, 1836, when he was made first lieutenant. But the routine of the office continued to chafe him and made him restive. Talcott had quit the Army for private engineering earlier in 1836 and Lee had almost been tempted to resign with him. If he should himself surrender his commission, he said, he would do so with less regret, now that Talcott was out. In February, 1837, Lee wrote him. You ask what are my prospects in the Corps? Bad enough, unless it is increased and something done for us, and then perhaps they will be better. As to what I intend doing, it is rather hard to answer. There is one thing certain, I must get away from here, nor can I consent to stay any longer than the rising of Congress. I should have made a desperate effort last spring, but Mary's health was so bad I could not have left her, and she could not have gone with me. I am waiting, looking and hoping for some good opportunity to bid an affectionate farewell to my dear Uncle Sam, and I seem to think that said opportunity is to drop in my lap like a ripe pear, for d l a stir have I made in the matter, and there again I am helped out by the talent, of procrastination, I before mentioned I possessed in so eminent a degree. You may think it remarkable that a man of my standing should not have been sought after by all these companies for internal improvements, but I assure you they have never even consulted me as to their best measures. Well, if people are so negligent of their own interests, they can't blame me for it. There was ebb and flow in his spirits for the next few years. In one letter, he would joke merrily, in the next, there would be ill concealed depression. A sense of frustration was slowly stealing over him, and as Mrs. Lee came back to health, he took refuge in his home life. The country looks very sweet now, he said in the spring of 1836, and the hill at Arlington covered with verdure and perfumed by the blossoms of the trees, the flowers of the garden, honeysuckles, yellow jasmine, etc., is more to my taste than at any other season of the year. But the brightest flower there blooming is my daughter. 
Oh, she is a rare one, and if only sweet sixteen, I would wish myself a cannibal that I might eat her up. As it is, I have given all the Yen ladies a holy day and hurry home to her every day. He carried on through the winter and spring of 1837 a somewhat grim joke with Talcott about the number of their respective children. With deliberate superiority he wrote, as to those articles you mention in the form of blankets and India rubber cloth, they have served my purpose, and if they can now serve yours, I shall be satisfied. Suspecting that the Talcott family had further promise of increase, he twigged Mrs. Talcott somewhat airily in his letters to her husband. He was anxious to review her progeny, he intimated, and wanted her to see her little cousins at Arlington. When she failed on one expected visit, he put a reproachful paragraph in a long, gossipy letter to her spouse, but Talcott, my beauty, how could you have served your uncle so? I know the sight of his red nose looming above the Washington Wharf would have been a grateful sight to you, and then your reception at Arlington would have been so warm, for it was afterwards ascertained that the servant in preparing your room had made up a large hickory fire, the thermometer then ranging to about 80 degrees. At Fort Monroe he had playfully contracted to made a lee to every Talcott, but now that the captain's children numbered five, you are aware that you must look out for connections for three of them in some other families, for I had given up in despair some years ago the hope of supplying them, and now I doubt where there is any one family in Virginia that can keep pace with their number. Having retired from the lists myself, I have engaged my sister Nanny, Smith Lee's wife, to enter the ring. She, however, is not sanguine, seeing that upon a trial of her speed, two for the same year was her only mark. The secti of the navy thinks it is time for Smith to go to sea. So your resources in that quarter are cut off. All this he wrote with unqualified assurance, and in his next letter he said, Tell my beautiful Talcott that we have been anxiously expecting the appearance of the new copy of her annual, which she has been editing so long for our gratification. Her rival in the other hemisphere, the Countess of Blessington, can produce nothing equal to her. I hope in the spring, before breaking ground, we may be able to get there for a short time, where besides the pleasure of seeing the authors, we can peruse at leisure each production and enjoy the sight of the masterpiece with the blue eyes. On May, 1837, the joke was turned on the censor of Talcott's domesticity, Lee was presented with a third child, a boy whom he named after his own friend and his wife's uncle, William Henry Fitzhugh of Ravensworth. Lee gamely welcomed the newcomer to the beloved circle of his family, and he held patiently, if unhappily, to the routine of the engineer's office, but he kept working to get away from Washington and back to active duty on some interesting project of engineering, even though he knew he would not be able to take his family with him. His opportunity came at last. General Greshet was a native of Missouri, very proud of the fact, and vastly interested in the development of the Mississippi. He had kept there one of his best officers, Captain Henry Shreve, in charge of the force that had been clearing snags from the bed of the river. Shreve had done very well, but now a situation developed that called for further action, the ever-changing Mississippi was cutting a new channel on the Illinois side of the river and was throwing up a bar opposite St. Louis. Another bar was forming in the stream from a point opposite the middle of the city as far down as its southern limits. The river commerce of St. Louis was in danger of complete destruction. In 1836 Congress made an appropriation of $15,000 with which to build a pier to give direction to the current of the river near St. Louis. Shreve thereupon drafted a plan for the pier but found that it was too late to begin work in 1836. He figured, also, that the appropriation would have to be increased by at least $50,000. Congress voted this amount. As a further improvement on the Upper Mississippi, the lawmakers provided money with which to cut a shipway through the rapids of the Mississippi near the Iowa-Missouri boundary. Shreve was something of an expert on snag removal and was active, but he manifestly could not superintend work along the whole of the Mississippi, the Red River, and the Missouri. In 1836, the work at St. Louis had to be delayed because Shreve was occupied elsewhere and no other engineer was available. Lee was familiar with all this in 1837, knew the difficulties of the work and sensed the loneliness of life so far from his home. But he was disgusted with official Washington and the spirit that prevailed there. So, as he subsequently confided, I volunteered my services to get rid of the office in Washington and the GNL at last agreed to my going. I was cognizant of so much iniquity in more ways than one that I feared for my morality, at no time strong, and had been trying for two years to quit. 
In his usual bantering style, he insisted to McKay, a few months after he reached the West, I will briefly tell you that they wanted a skillful engineer on the upper Mississippi and Missouri and sent me. You know I was heartily sick of the duties of the office and wished to get away. The GENL has gratified me. I also had a desire to see this country, so I was gratified again. The assignment of Lee for this enterprise was dated April 6, and permission was given him to purchase the instruments necessary for the surveys, but he was not immediately dispatched, probably because Mrs. Lee was expectant. While Lee waited, General Greshett went to St. Louis and personally made an inspection of the work to be done there. Greshett promised the mayor of the city, John F. Darby, to send him a competent engineer, but did not mention Lee's name. He was in high spirits at the prospect of a change in his drab, uninteresting duties and immeasurably relieved at the improvement in Mrs. Lee's health. His wife was very well, he reported to Talcott. Her little limb is as ugly as ever, though she still thinks his nose is to subside, his mouth contract, eyes to open, hair to curl, etc., etc., and in fact to become a perfect beauty. I shall leave my family in the care of my eldest son, Custis, aged five, who will take them over the mountains somewhere this summer, and his grandmother along with them. A new and stimulating period of his life was about to open, and he sensed it. Chapter 9 Youth Conspires Against a Giant Delay in procuring some of the instruments forced Lee to postpone his start for the Mississippi in the summer of 1837. Despairing finally of getting delivery, he left on two days' notice for Philadelphia to make the purchases there. Later he received authorization, if he could not find what he wanted in the Quaker City, to travel to New York. He set out with 2nd Lieutenant Montgomery C. Meigs, a young engineer of 21 who had graduated at West Point in the class of 1836. Meigs was a Georgian by birth and later became quartermaster general of the United States Army during the war between the states. He it was, also, who superintended the erection of the Capitol Dome in Washington. The two went to Pittsburgh, where they were lucky enough to find a new steamer bound for St. Louis. Aboard this craft they went down the Ohio to Louisville. There the vessel obligingly waited while Lee looked over the equipment that Captain Shreve had ordered for work on the rapids. Two machine boats for raising stone were nearly complete, and a small steamer for towing them was almost ready. Lee directed that the vessels be brought on to St. Louis under a captain and crew whom he engaged for that purpose. With the assurance that all work on the boats would be finished in four or five days, and that they would then follow him to the Mississippi, Lee set out from Louisville, counting himself fortunate, as he put it, to have a clean stateroom and clean boat the whole way. He arrived at St. Louis August 5th, and, with introductions from General Greshett, soon made some desirable acquaintances. St. Louis did not impress him at first. It is, said he, the dearest and dirtiest place I was ever in. Our daily expenses about equal our daily pay. In a later letter he said, I make an exception in favor of the pretty girls if there are any here, and I know there are, for I have met them in no place, in no garb, in no situation, that I did not feel my heart open to them like a flower to the sun. This closing note of gaiety was somewhat forced, for in his letters home there was constant thought of Mrs. Lee and of her heavy responsibility in rearing the children alone. He wrote her in the tones of a troubled and inexperienced father, the improved condition of the children, which you mention, was a source of great comfort to me, and as I suppose, by this time, you have all returned to Arlington, you will be able to put them under a proper restraint, which you are probably obliged to relax while visiting among strangers, and which that indulgence will probably render more essential. Our dear little boy seems to have among his friends the reputation of being hard to manage, a distinction not at all desirable, as it indicates self-will and obstinacy. Perhaps these are qualities which he really possesses, and he may have a better right to them than I am willing to acknowledge, but it is our duty, if possible, to counteract them and assist him to bring them under his control. I have endeavored, in my intercourse with him, to require nothing but what was in my opinion necessary or proper, and to explain to him temperately its propriety, at a time when he could listen to my arguments, not at the moment of his being vexed and his little faculties warped by passion. I have also tried to show him that I was firm in my demands, and constant in their enforcement, and that he must comply with them, and I let him see that I looked to their execution, in order to relieve him as much as possible from the temptation to break them. 
Since my efforts have been so unsuccessful, I fear I have altogether failed in accomplishing my purpose, but I hope to be able to profit by my experience. You must assist me in my attempts, and we must endeavor to combine the mildness and forbearance of the mother with the sternness and, perhaps, unreasonableness of their father. This is a subject on which I think much, though M may blame me for not reading more. I am ready to acknowledge the good advice contained in the textbooks and believe that I see the merit of their reasoning generally, but what I want to learn is to apply what I already know. I pray God to watch over and direct our efforts in guarding our dear little son, that we may bring him up in the way he should go. Oh, what pleasure I lose in being separated from my children. Nothing can compensate me for that, still I must remain here, ready to perform what little such I can, and hope for the best. In a word, he was lonesome and homesick. He was exasperated, also, by the non-arrival of the boats from Louisville. They are the greatest people for promising and not fulfilling that I ever saw. Never hesitate to undertake anything but completing is another matter. So you will see, instead of being nearly done with our examinations here, we have not commenced them. When the boats at last reached St. Louis, the river was still eight or ten feet above low water, but on the rapids it was reported to be at the lowest. So Lee packed off his force as soon as possible, intent on making a survey of the upper rapids, which were approximately 150 miles above St. Louis. Prior to this formal beginning of Lee's work on the Mississippi, the activities of the federal government for the improvement of navigation had been confined chiefly to the removal of snags, caused by trees, or parts of trees, that fell into the stream and became embedded in its soft bottom. These were an endless danger to steamboats, for the vessels then in use were lightly planked and had no bulkheads. When one of them ran into submerged timber, it usually filled at once and sank in the channel. To be snagged had a definite and unhappy meaning on the river. Captain Shreve had devised a method of removing snags and sometime prior to 1830 had invented a snag boat for this purpose. From that time onward, when the water was low enough to permit, Shreve and his assistants or substitutes scoured long stretches of the river searching for snags. In good seasons one steam snag boat would remove more than 2,000. In addition, axemen employed by the engineers worked on the banks of the Mississippi and felled trees on the banks that were doomed to be washed away by the current. The engineers and the people along the river were divided as to the wisdom of this. Some maintained that it simply added new material for snags. Where this feeling was strong, the engineers had sometimes to suspend their labor. Beyond this, when Lee set out from St. Louis for the rapids, little had been done for the improvement of the river. At Cumberland Island, on the Ohio, a dam had been constructed to save a situation somewhat similar to that at St. Louis. As for the Des Moines Rapids and the mouth of Rock River, Captain Shreve had made examinations and had concluded that a perfect channel could be cut through both. That was all. Lee, therefore, was doing pioneer work on the river, and he had some of the experience of the pioneer. As engineers and their helpers came to the lower rapids, near the mouth of the Des Moines River, their steamboat ran on the rocks, nor could they budge her at that stage of the water. Instead, therefore, of examining the upper rapids first, they accepted circumstance and with their boat as a base made their surveys of three or four miles of the river. Then, Lee explained later, we found an empty log house in which we placed our men and eatables, which so completely filled its single apartment that Meigs and myself took up our blankets and walked a short mile to the city of Des Moines composed of the worst kind of a small log cabin which contained the proprietor and the entire population. Here we were kindly received and all accommodated with the softest puncheon on the floor. How much I could tell you, Lee went on, of the same city, its puncheons, dwellings and inhabitants, but I must live to my limits. In this way we progressed to the head, of the lower rapids, where we found plenty of house room at the Des Moines garrison. We then moved to the upper rapids, being obliged to leave our steamboat behind, comma, and commencing at its head, worked downwards in the same manner, but with more comfort, as we found a better class of people and better accommodations, besides having the whole range of an old steamboat or two sunk on the rocks, whose upper decks were out of the water. I assure you we were not modest, but fell without difficulty into the manners of the country, and helped ourselves to everything that came our way. And now I think of it, we were the only lawful squatters in that region, and perhaps alone had authority to be there. 
I need not tell you what a beautiful country it is, and I think it some time, some future day, must be a great one. You would scarcely recognize it. Villages have sprung up everywhere, and some quite pretty ones too. Stevenson, between Rock Island and the mouth of Rock River, Quincy, Burlington, etc., were the most thriving. Some ten years hence, many that I saw will be even smaller than they are now, while others will have grown into cities. If you can tell me which these last will be, I will make your fortune. The formation of a good channel for these rapids will be of immense advantage to the country, and great anxiety seems to be felt on the subject. The wrecked steamer was a somewhat unstable base, for the lower deck was submerged and great holes had been cut in the cabin floor for the removal of the engines, but the staterooms were dry and afforded much better quarters than were to be found ashore. The surveyors left her in the morning and, at the end of the day, came back to her, and if they were so minded, could sit on her deck and fish for blue catfish, with which to enlarge their menu. The survey of the upper rapids convinced Lee that a channel could be cut without great difficulty. By the end of September the survey was completed and the party was able to descend to the lower rapids on a steamer bound that way. They found a great encampment of the Chippewa Indians at the Des Moines Rapids, awaiting the usual distribution of gifts. Lee did not tarry, for an unexpected rise in the river had floated their own steamer, the one that had gone ashore when they first ascended the stream. With all his men and equipment Lee went back to St. Louis, easy in his mind as to the upper rapids, but puzzling over the engineering problem presented at the lower rapids. He was in St. Louis by October 11th, somewhat lonesome and anxious for the company of his wife and children, but better pleased with the city and ready to make his examination of the sandbars that threatened the complete ruin of the harbor of St. Louis. The main current of the Mississippi, strengthened by the waters of the Missouri, at that time flowed rapidly along the Illinois shore for several miles below the juncture of the two rivers. Then the main current was deflected toward the Missouri side and ran to the west of Cascarot Island, which was a little more than four miles above the upper end of St. Louis. Below Cascarot Island, the stream narrowed into a gorge and was as deep as 53 feet. Southward the river spread out again until it was about 1,500 yards wide, at a point about two miles above the city. Here the current began to divide. Part of it continued along the Missouri shore, part was thrown against the opposite Illinois shore, where it wore away the bank. The tendency of the current on the Missouri side was to diminish and on the Illinois side to deepen. Between the two shores an island had been thrown up in the middle of the river years before Lee came west. This island was about 500 yards across and about a mile long. Above it a long shoal was gradually extending itself upstream. The lower end of the island extended downstream until it was nearly opposite the center of St. Louis. It was covered in 1837 with a thick growth of flourishing cottonwood trees and was known as Bloody Island because it was the ground usually chosen for duels. There was fear that as the current wore away the Illinois shore beyond Bloody Island, the stream on the St. Louis side would become so shallow that the harbor would be ruined. Bloody Island, however, was not so serious in itself as in the condition it helped to create. The old channel of the Mississippi, below the city, had kept to the Missouri bank, but for a number of reasons, chiefly, perhaps, because of the diversion of water by Bloody Island, this channel had slowly filled in after about 1818, and a large shoal had formed opposite the lower end of the town. This shoal crowded in toward the Missouri side, narrowed the channel, and choked the entrance to it at the downstream end. At length it became known as Duncan's Island, and its area of some 200 acres was covered, like Bloody Island, with cottonwood trees. The current seemed to be adding new shoals below Duncan's Island. What could be done to save the harbor? That was the question to which Lee now devoted himself. The first essential was an accurate map. Getting the finances of his enterprise in hand and organizing his forces, he rented the second floor of a warehouse on the levee as his office and sent out parties on either side of the river to make the surveys and to do the triangulations. The actual drafting of the map he put under the direction of Meigs. The surveying he handled in person, with the assistance of J. S. Moorhead, his steamboat captain, and Henry Kaiser of St. Louis, employed for the purpose. As the survey revealed the depth of the water and showed what the current was doing, Lee developed his plan for utilizing the current to wash away Duncan's Island and the other sandbars. Shreve had previously devised a scheme, in part, and Gresham himself had studied the problem closely. 
Lee's solution, which was quickly reached, was an adaptation of what both Grashit and Shreve had proposed. The whole plan, as presented in a formal report to General Grashit on December 6, 1837, was very simple. From the Illinois shore, a long dike was to be run to the head of Bloody Island, with the object of diverting the waters of the river to the western, or St. Louis side of the island. The line of this dike is marked AB on the sketch printed above. The face of the island beyond the dike was to be revet, AC, so that it would not be washed away by the force of the current. At the foot of Bloody Island another dike was to be made, D, in order to throw the full force of the current against the head of Duncan's Island and against the shoals that were forming between that and Bloody Island. Lee confessed that the construction of these dikes would be attended with great difficulty. The total cost was estimated at $158,554. He wanted to talk over the whole project with Talcott and he was debating in his mind whether he was right in proposing to start the dike at the head of Bloody Island. However, he was satisfied that the obstacles to navigation could be removed and that the work was well worth well in order to stimulate the growing commerce of St. Louis, in which he was now much interested. By the time this report was finished in 1837, it was too late to attempt to do anything in execution of the plan that winter. Lee accordingly procured permission to return to Washington, disbanded his party, laid up the steamboat on the Ohio, made contract for building another, for the next year, ordered four new flatboats, and with Meek started eastward over the Cumberland Road, via Wheeling. At Frederick, they struck the new Baltimore and Ohio Railroad, though the cars had to be drawn by horses for a part of the distance. It was Lee's first journey by train, his first contact with the transportation that was to play so weighty a part in the strategy of his campaigns. He probably got home about Christmas. Lee parted from Meigs when they reached Washington and was not again fortunate enough to have him as an assistant, but he was always affectionately remembered by the younger man, even when war divided them. Lee was then, Meigs wrote long after, in the vigor of youthful strength, with a noble and commanding presence, and an admirable, graceful and athletic figure. He was one with whom nobody ever wished or ventured to take a liberty, though kind and generous to all his subordinates, admired by all women, and respected by all men. He was the model of a soldier and the beau ideal of a Christian man. Lee spent the rest of the winter of 183738 partly on leave at Arlington and partly on duty in the engineer's office in Washington. Early in the spring, he began to make arrangements and to assemble his supplies. For experience had shown him that at St. Louis he could procure little beyond labor and raw material and that even in Washington some of the things that he needed were unprocurable. He had to order drawing instruments from Europe to take the place of Talcott's, which he had borrowed the previous year. Tracing paper had to be sent him from Washington when he required it, later in the season. Domestic preparations had to be made, also, because this time Mrs. Lee and the three children were to accompany him. Shortly after March 25th, the family set out for Pittsburgh. Arriving there, they had to wait for a week to get a steamboat down the Ohio to Louisville. A week was quite enough. I must say, Lee had to confess, that, Pittsburgh, is the darkest, blackest place I ever put foot in. Even the snow, milk and everything intended by nature to be white, not excepting the rosy cheeks of the pretty girls, partake of its dingy nature, and I am afraid my complexion is ruined. From Pittsburgh, the family descended the Ohio on a steamer. There had been intermittent rain and snow over the whole journey thus far and it continued till Louisville was reached. Our journey, Lee chronicled, was as pleasant as could be expected in a country of this sort. The boys stood it manfully and indeed, improved on it, and my dame, taking advantage of frequent opportunities for a nap, and refreshed as often by the good viands of the West, it would make your mouth water if I was to dilate upon the little roast pigs and sausages, defied the crowding, squeezing and scrambling. You know these little disagreements are to be met with at all times and in all countries, and are not worth mentioning, but as they form in part the pleasure of the trip. At Louisville, where they stopped, they were most kindly received, being invited to a wedding and enjoying much hospitality. In Cincinnati, Lee made some purchases of furniture, which was put aboard the steamboat Moselle for shipment to St. Louis. Luckily, the family did not embark on the same craft, for it was blown up in a disastrous accident, and Lee's belongings, as he put it, took a very different course from the one projected. 
On May 1, Mrs. Lee and the children got their first view of St. Louis, but as they found the rooms Lee had engaged for them had been otherwise disposed of, it was June 1 before they were finally placed in comfortable quarters, with meals at the home of Dr. William Beaumont, an army surgeon and the leading professional men of the town. The Beaumonts had three young children who gleefully joined the little Lees in place suited to the Great River. As drumming was the mania at Old Point, riding and driving at Arlington, so, steamboating is all the rage here. They convert themselves even into steamboats, ring their bells, raise their steam, high pressure, and put off. They fire up so frequently, and keep on so heavy a pressure of steam, as Lee himself voraciously reported, that I am constantly fearing they will burst their boilers. Lee was very happy to have his family so pleasantly situated, as he expected his work up the Mississippi would require his absence from St. Louis often and for long periods. Instead, he remained for the most of the season in the city, for reasons that did not spell satisfaction. On May 14, there arrived at St. Louis Lt. Horace Bliss, who was to be Lee's assistant for the year. With him Bliss brought from Louisville the steamer and the flatboats that Lee had ordered the previous winter. Lee planned to put Bliss in immediate charge at the Des Moines Rapids and dispatched him up the river on May 19 with some of the boats and a force of men. These were to be reinforced as soon as the river was low enough for work to begin. At that time, the Mississippi was five feet above low water and was falling, but it went down so slowly that Bliss and his men spent weeks in waiting. Toward the end of July the gauge was so low that Lee believed blasting could be undertaken in a few days, and he sent up additional men from St. Louis, only to be faced by a swift and unexplained rise that carried the stream to 12 feet and more above low water. Lee held his force at the rapids until the lateness of the season and the slow decline of the waters convinced him that nothing could be done. He therefore laid off his men and was about to abandon the project for the year when the river fell as rapidly as it had risen. It was enough to make a man damn the Mississippi and all its vagaries. Calling up a small improvised personnel, Lee set it to work on September 20, cutting out rock at a particularly troublesome point on the west side of the Illinois chute of the lower rapids. The drills showed a flint surface of an inch or two in thickness. Below this were 18 to 20 inches of limestone, and then a decayed silicious or slaty stone which eroded very rapidly when exposed to the current. The men blasted the rock away in great blocks weighing a ton or more and then removed it on their flatboats, but they had scarcely cleared away the point they had attacked, some 408 perches of stone, when cold weather came, on October 10. Lee once again reduced force and tried to carry on with the hardiest of the men, whose wages he more than doubled. The weather was too severe even for them. On the night of October 16 there was a quarter of an inch of ice, and the next day it snowed. The men simply could not endure the chilly water. Reluctantly, Lee had to close the year's activities, with only 20 working days to his credit. What had been done during that time had not improved navigation perceptibly, but it had convinced Lee, more than ever, that a good channel through the rapids could be made. Lee made several journeys to the falls during the season and he personally directed the last attempt, but most of his time he spent on the St. Louis project. Keeping the complicated finances of the undertaking well in hand, he made war on the sandbars. With the money available he could not construct both the dikes during 1838, so he started the one intended to relieve the worst situation, directly in the harbor of the town. He reasoned that the dike he proposed to build from the foot of Bloody Island would throw the heaviest current against the head of Duncan's Island and would deepen both the Old Channel next the Missouri shore and the Sanchoke Channel between Bloody Island and Duncan's Island, as will appear from an examination of the map on page 146. In accordance with this plan, before the end of June, the river being then 11 feet above low water, Lee started the dike close to the downstream end of Bloody Island, on the side nearest St. Louis. Two rows of piles were driven from 12 to 17 feet into the bed of the river, with a space of 40 feet between the rows. This space was filled with sand and small stone, raised well above the water level. On both the outer faces of the dike, brush was dumped into the river until it extended 30 to 40 feet beyond the piles, with an exterior slope of 3 to 1. The brush was then anchored with stone, in the expectation that sand would soon fill in all the open spaces. 
Although the river continued high until September, Lee pushed the construction of the dike, and before the season was over he had run it so far downstream that the lower end was opposite Market Street, a distance of approximately 2,500 feet, or virtually the whole length contemplated under the plan of 1837. As the dike was lengthened, Lee anxiously watched to see if it would have the effect he anticipated. It was the first large design he had ever undertaken, and into it he had put all the reasoning of which he was capable, and all the knowledge he had been able to acquire. Daily he studied the force of the current, almost hourly he turned his eyes to Duncan's Island. The current, as if repenting its whimsicalities, rushed obligingly down. The mud of the island, expecting no such onslaught, began to wash rapidly away. By the end of the construction season, 700 feet of the island had disappeared. Not only so, but the channel across the bar between Bloody Island and Duncan's Island, below the foot of the dike, had been deepened seven feet. The old channel had been much improved, and on the Illinois side the 18-foot channel had been filled in until it was only eight feet deep. When boats once more could reach the lower part of the city there was as much rejoicing among the merchants as there was in the heart of the young engineer. The confidence of St. Louis people was restored, and a building boom began. In his annual report Lee wrote with modest conservatism of what had been accomplished, but in his private correspondence he showed himself convinced that the harbor could be saved and all the problems solved if the height of the lower end of the dike were increased and the projected dike above Bloody Island were constructed. To that upper dike, though he did not know when he would have sufficient funds for constructing it, Lee gave much thought. During the previous winter the shoal above the head of Bloody Island had stopped the ice, which thereupon formed a barrier across the head of the island. This in turn had thrown both water and laid ice to the east of the island. The channel on the Illinois side had accordingly been deepened still farther, and more stream flow had been diverted from the Missouri side. The proposed dike at the head of the island was more necessary than ever. But how could the dike withstand the pressure of the winter's ice if the barrier were drawn on a straight line from the Illinois shore to the head of Bloody Island? Lee had foreseen this difficulty the previous year, but the alternative was the expensive one of starting the dike much higher upstream, near an old dry slough, so as to present a slanting face to the ice. The cost of this had made Lee hesitate in 1837. Now he saw the necessity in sharper terms. As he studied his problem, he reasoned that the longer slanting dike would run through shallow water, whereas the dike he had originally planned perpendicular to the Illinois shore had to cross a 20-foot channel. The expense of the longer dike would not, therefore, be greater than the first estimates, if proper economy were shown in its construction. Lee accordingly proposed the change in his annual report, frankly stating that the dike design the previous year might not be permanent. He proceeded also to procure drawings and to award a contract for a steam pile driver. The old and the new proposals for dikes stood in the relation to each other shown in the plan on this page. The single line represents the first and the double line the second proposed dike. The season continued favorable and the interest of St. Louis in the project remained high. As Congress had delayed appropriations for harbor improvement, citizens of the town had advanced $15,000 to prevent a suspension of the enterprise. When Congress adjourned on July 9, 1838, without allowing any money for St. Louis, the mayor and the citizens authorized Lee to spend the balance of the fund they had raised. This action, as might have been expected in any municipality at any time, became an issue in local politics. Lee found himself, for the first time, the subject of contention between factions and in the press. The Whig newspaper, the Missouri Republican, charged that the state's Democratic congressman had been negligent in seeking an allotment from Congress for the improvement of the river. The Argus replied that Lee himself had stated that enough was available to complete the program for the year. The Republican replied with some skepticism. Controversy developed, during which Lee very carefully avoided taking sides. The character of the superintendent, the Republican admitted, forbids the idea that he would make such a declaration for electioneering purposes, in fact, we believe he deported himself throughout our election as every government officer should, but as very few at this day do, taking no part in the contest. Lee's interest in his work and the success of his labors won much praise. 
Since the commencement of the work in May last, one informed correspondent said in the Republican, it has been prosecuted with great activity and with unexpected dispatch, when the character of the locality, the scarcity of laborers, and other difficulties are considered. I have been much gratified by a personal inspection of the works, and during my visit I observed the ingenious manner in which the superintendent had taken advantage of the late rise of the river, which, though it caused a suspension of operations for three weeks, yet in consequence of dispositions previously made, it has caused a deposit of much alluvian about the dike, to the manifest saving of many thousand cords of stone. At a public improvement meeting on September 29, Montgomery Blair moved a resolution endorsing Lee's energy and skill, urging appropriations by Congress and recommending, if the federal government did nothing, that the municipality act. Acting on the authorization given by the city and approved by General Greshet, Lee made the most of the remainder of the city's fund and began construction of the upper end of the slanting dike that was to run from the Illinois shore to the head of Bloody Island. Two rows of piles were industriously driven for a part of the way down this dike, but cold weather came early in November and the river was so filled with running ice that it was not possible to fill all the space between the rows with stone. During the months of this active work at St. Louis, Lee's sense of frustration was diminished by the consciousness that he was achieving something. He found continuing delight in his children and unfailing interest in the country. The election excitement was a novelty to him. He was even amused by the manner in which he grew thin from his exertions, I am fast wasting away, he gaily admitted, and there is but little left now but nose and teeth. The strain of the work, however, must have been severe, and if there was less of frustration in his heart, there was less of the old exuberance of spirit and more of resentment. At least once during the summer he broke out, partly because of the obstacles he had to overcome in performing his work and partly because of an injustice that had been done his friend, Jack McKay. He wrote, The manner in which the army is considered and treated by the country and those whose business it is to nourish and take care of it is enough to disgust every one with the service and has the effect of driving every good soldier from it and rendering those who remain discontented, careless and negligent. The instance that you mention in your own person of the authorities at Washington listening to the miserable slander of dirty tergiversators and then acting on such filthy expert evidence is an insult to the army and shows in what light its feelings are estimated and its rights sacrificed at the shrine of popularity. I wish all, the work, were done and I was back in Virginia. He was in this state of mind when he received notice that he had been commissioned captain of engineers as of August 7, 1838. Lee was gratified, of course, but not quite sure the outcome would be for the best. I do not know, said he, whether I ought to rejoice or not, as in all my schemes of happiness I look forward to returning to some quiet corner among the hills of Virginia where I can indulge my natural propensities without interruption, and I suppose the more comfortably I am fixed in the army, the less likely I shall be to leave it. As, however, one great cause of my not putting these schemes in execution arises from want of money, I shall in the meantime handle with pleasure the small addition arising from what the GNL calls the tardy promotion. As promotion went in those days of a small army, his new rank was not tardy, certainly as compared with his former advancement. He had been brevet second lieutenant from July 1, 1829, to July 19, 1832, he had been second lieutenant from that date until November 21, 1836, but he had been lieutenant only one year and eight months. It was, however, to be more than 18 years before he received further promotion, except by brevet. Lee was well within the facts in saying he could handle with pleasure the additional pay of his new grade, for not long after he had completed most of his financial statements and had filed his reports on the season's work, he was given an intimation that he might expect a fourth baby in the early summer of 1839. The prospect was not inviting, his family was increasing more rapidly than his income. As his work lightened, his unhappiness diminished and his state of mind became easier, but late in December, 1838, he received one of the worst shocks of his whole life. Ever since his early years at Old Point he had enjoyed the affectionate encouragement of General Charles Greshet, whom he regarded as a most capable officer and a gentleman of unchallengeable integrity. To Lee's bewilderment and to his profound distress there came news that Greshet had been dismissed from the service of the United States for refusing to account for certain public funds. The general claimed that the money in dispute was due him as commissions and allowances, the treasurer disputed this, the case went to the president, who decided against Greshet. 
and when the engineer still refused to yield, the president ordered his name dropped from the roster of the army. The Secretary of War was not unfriendly to Greshit. In clearing the general's books, the secretary ordered all his accounts opened anew and settled on the most liberal terms, and he directed that if Greshit were found to owe the government money, suit for it should be entered against Greshit in the Missouri courts. But that did not change the grim fact that the chief engineer was out of the service, disgraced. It came upon me like a thunderclap, Lee said in acutest grief, and I was as little prepared for such an event as I would have been for the annihilation of the city of Washington by an earthquake, and indeed I now can scarcely realize it. Nothing has distressed me so much, for, many years, and indeed, separated as I am from a knowledge of the facts, and all ability to extend relief or assistance, with rumor daily crying out the worst, I believe the news of his death would have been less painful to me nor when I call to mind his zeal and integrity in the discharge of his duties, with such of the circumstances as have come to my knowledge, and the indulgences shown to others having lesser claims, can I either comprehend or account for a result that has deprived the country of so valuable an officer, or the army of so worthy a member. Lee was not a man to desert a disgraced friend. He conferred with the general's brothers, who lived in St. Louis, and later he attended the hearing of the government suit. On his next visit to Washington he collected papers and data the general desired in his defense, but it was to no purpose, Greshit retained Lee's affection and good opinion, but he ended his days as a clerk in the general land office in Washington. Lee concluded that, from some cause either real or imaginary, Greshit's removal from the bureau was determined on, and that the situation of his accounts was taken advantage of, as the means, and that the dismissal was upon the true issue. In Greshit's place, Colonel Joseph G. Totten was named, an officer of whom Lee had seen little, and one who had no personal interest in the project Lee was directing. It was several years before Lee had the same intimate standing with Colonel Totten that he had enjoyed with General Greshit. While the Greshit affair was still a fresh wound, Lee closed his accounts and formally ended his work for the year. He was free, then, to go home, but it was already January 5, 1839, and all navigation was closed on the river. His only means of getting back to Arlington would be to ride overland, and that, of course, was not practicable with three children and with his wife in a delicate condition. They were forced, therefore, to remain at St. Louis. It was the first winter they had been away from Arlington since 1834. Chapter 10 Lee Studies His Ancestors for diversion during his months of idleness in the winter of 1838 to 1839, when his own future seemed none too bright, Lee continued a study of his genealogy, a study he had begun in 1837. Then he had tried to get a correct copy of the family coat of arms in order that he might have a seal cut. He knew, of course, his general line of descent and his degree of kinship with most of the other Lees of Northern Virginia, but he had little information about the early generations of his family in the New World. He was so unfamiliar with his arms that he wrote down the motto as non incautus futurus instead of futuri, not unmindful of the future, a mistake over which he would have blushed in the days when Mr. Leary had been teaching him his cases. Captain Talcott, whom Lee consulted, was not satisfied with his former assistant's heraldry. A quest for correct data followed. I once saw in the hands of cousin Edmund, for the only time in my life, Lee explained to Cassius F. Lee, our family tree, and as I begin in my old age, he was then thirty-one, to feel a little curiosity relative to my forefathers, their origin, whereabouts, etc., any information you can give me will increase the obligation. Cassius Lee had a copy of the coat of arms, which, it developed, was not quite correctly drawn, and he also possessed a sketch of the family made by William Lee before the American Revolution. These were forwarded to Captain Lee. He did not, at the time, fathom all the heraldic mysteries, but before sending the papers to Captain Talcott, Lee read and perhaps copied the sketch. It formed the basis of his knowledge of his forebears, and he believed its assertions to the day of his death. Inasmuch as the Virginia Lees were bearing as early as 1659 the arms of one branch of the Lee family of Shropshire, it is quite probable that kinship existed between them. If so, the stock of Robert E. Lee was that of an upper-class English family of somewhat better than average intelligence, whose descent can be surmised from the end of the 12th century and can be followed with some probability from the 16th. But every effort to establish definite connection between Robert E. Lee's American ancestors and any line of the English Lees has failed. It does not matter. 
After reading his cousin William's manuscript, Robert E. Lee believed that he had in his veins the blood of conquerors, crusaders, and cavaliers. That belief contributed to his sense of noblesse oblige, and if it was based on fiction it was as influential with him as if it had been sustained by the adjuration of all the heralds of Europe. The American ancestry of Robert E. Lee began with his great-great-great-grandfather, Richard Lee, who, as early as 1642, was residing in Virginia and was patenting land as a married man. Before his death, in 1663 or 1664, he became one of the most considerable men of the colony. Owning some 16,000 acres of land, he must have lived in a style almost baronial. The son of the first Richard Lee bore the same name. He was born in 1647 and died March 12, 1714, a gentleman, said Governor Alexander Spotswood, who knew him well, of as fair character as any in the country for his exact justice, honesty and unexceptionable loyalty. Educated at Oxford, he was more interested in letters than in life, and more often to be found in his large library than on his wide plantations. Robert E. Lee, who was his great-great-grandson, wrote of him, almost reproachfully, in later life, Richard spent his time in study, writing his notes in Greek, Latin, and Hebrew, and did not improve his paternal estate, which might have produced a princely revenue. By the third generation, the Lee connection was becoming large. Henry Lee, General Lee's great-grandfather, was the fifth son of Richard Lee, the scholar, by his wife Letitia Corbin, herself a well-born woman of a prominent colonial family. This Henry Lee, 1691-1747, lived at Lee Hall on the Potomac, adjoining the older Lee Mansion, Mount Pleasant. While probably not so wealthy a man as his father or grandfather, Henry Lee I was a planter of ample means. He married Mary Bland, daughter of Colonel Richard Bland, representative of a family of high station. Henry Lee I had a son Henry, who was born in 1729 and died in 1787. He was Robert E. Lee's grandfather and for convenience is styled Henry II. Tradition has it that this Henry Lee and his wife were rather dull persons, so dull, indeed, that their phrase-making son Light Horse Harry was wont to explain his own scintillation by saying two negatives make an affirmative. But the evidence now available does not bear out tradition, if Henry Lee II was not a brilliant man, he had his share of mental endowment. And if his few remaining letters suggest that he might have been the better for a closer acquaintance with Dr. Johnson's dictionary, his spelling is no worse than that of a certain gentleman who resided up the Potomac at Mount Vernon. Many of his distinctive qualities, in surprising confirmation of current theories of eugenics, are plainly discernible in his grandson, Robert E. Lee. Grandfather Henry Lee II on December 1, 1753, married Lucy Grimes, who is supposed to have been the lowland beauty that won the heart of the youthful Washington. Probably bettering himself financially by this union, Henry Lee developed the plantation known as Leesylvania, which occupied a point of land extending into the Potomac, three miles north of the old town of Dumfries, in Prince William County. There he raised tobacco that usually was of a superior quality, and there he attained to measurable prosperity. He was apparently a favorite in the community, according to his grandson, and he served Prince William for many years as County Lieutenant, Burgess, member of the Revolutionary Conventions, and Justice of the Peace. In 1773 to 1774 he was among the Virginia negotiators of Indian treaties. Although possessing no dominant qualities of leadership, he was heart and hand in the revolutionary causes. We are determined, he wrote in 1775, on preserving our liberties if necessary at the expense of our blood, being resolved not to survive slavery. As might be expected, his letters show him proud of the achievements of Light Horse Harry Lee. Your brother's enterprise, he wrote another of his sons, does him signal honor, and I flatter myself it will not be in the power of his enemies to pluck from him those laurels they cannot acquire, and on his conduct being inquired into, his military fame will be raised. I agree with you that the surprise of Paulus Hook casts a shade on Stony Point. Serving in the General Assembly during the time his son and namesake was winning fame in arms, Henry Lee heard all the empty rumors of victory and disaster that come to a wartime capital. He took a coldly critical attitude towards these reports and in time developed a certain flair for analyzing them. This is amusingly illustrated in a letter he wrote from Williamsburg on June 12, 1779, to his son Charles, who was then studying law in Philadelphia. 
two Frenchmen had come from Charleston, S.C., with a blood-stirring report of a great American victory. On their heels, a British deserter told how the Continentals were advancing on the English, who were cooped up on James Island and likely to share Burgoyne's fate unless their fleet arrived and relieved them. The truth is I believe, Henry Lee concluded in disgust, they have had some small skirmishing and we got the better. His own grandson, contending with wild rumor as he studied the intelligence reports of the Army of Northern Virginia, might well have employed those very words. System, thrift, and love of horses were three characteristics of Henry Lee II, plainly observable from the few of his papers that have survived, and equally pronounced in Robert E. Lee. I received your agreeable letter by post, but without date, Henry told his student son Charles in Philadelphia, the best way is dating letters at the top, for fear of omitting in the hurry of conclusion, a practice the grandson always followed. In another letter Robert Lee's grandfather wrote, as soon as I get home shall endeavor to contrive you a remittance. The expenses of your Philadelphia. Studies when had you taken my advice might in a great measure have been saved, had you applied your hours wasted in idle pursuits of dissipation to Cook, Sick, Blackstone, etc., having had a genel. Knowledge of the system of law tracks, possessing the fundamental principles, you might now have been employed in reading the reports applying the practical cases and digesting the reasoning of the pleaders and judges on the applied maxims. Despite the thrifty scolding, when Henry Lee came to die, he named Charles his executor, rather than his eldest son, Light Horse Harry, who never could keep money, and he provided that in case of Charles's death, his son Richard Blandley and his cousin Ludwell Lee should serve in that capacity. In his will he took pains, also, to list the horses and the bay mare famous, that were to be his wife's. His letters to Charles, and his messages through him to Henry Lee, contain several references to the young men's animals. Your mare, he wrote Charles, is in good order at Whaley's and with full by Megnanine, her colt is small but in good order, and a pretty neat turn thing. I would not advise the sale of her. There had thus been in succession two Richard Lees and three Henry Lees as follows. Richard Lee I, died in 1663 or 1664, M. Anna, last name unknown. Richard Lee II, 1647 to 1714, M. Letitia Corbin. Henry Lee I, 1691-1747, M. Mary Bland. Henry Lee II, 1729-1787, M. Lucy Grimes. Henry Lee III, 1758-1818, M. and Hill Carter. Robert E. Lee. For these five generations, at least, the ancestors of Robert E. Lee had sustained their social position or had bettered it by advantageous marriages. For in those instances where the younger son inherited comparatively small property he increased it by winning the hand of some wealthy heiress. No misalliance marred the strain of Robert E. Lee's blood or lowered his inherited station as a gentleman. Eugenically, his career is perhaps, above all, a lesson in the cumulative effect of generations of wise marriages. Along with this gentle blood, Lee inherited a tradition of public service and of leadership. The family record in this respect bears out the statement George Washington is reported to have made in 1777. Said he, I know of no country that can produce a family all distinguished as clever men, as are Lees. The first Richard Lee was Justice, Burgess, Secretary of State for the Colony and a member of the Council. To hold the office of Councillor in Virginia was to have one's social status fixed above Cavill. Richard Lee II, despite his love of books, took time to be Burgess, Colonel of Horse, and Councillor. Henry Lee I was lieutenant colonel of militia, but apparently held no other public office. Henry Lee II was justice, longtime burgess, delegate to revolutionary conventions, county lieutenant, and member of the state senate. The public record of Light Horse Harry Lee has been given already. A great-granduncle of Robert E. Lee, Thomas Lee, brother of Henry Lee I, was a member of the council and later was its president and acting governor of Virginia. His sons were the remarkable brothers, Thomas Ludwell Lee, Philip Ludwell Lee, Richard Henry Lee, Francis Lightfoot Lee, William Lee, and Arthur Lee, all of whom attained to definite distinction in the service of their state or of their country. Two of them were signers of the Declaration of Independence. Still another branch of the Stratford Lees, as they were called, went to Maryland, where it was long prominent in public life. 
from Richard Lee, the immigrant, through the sixth generation, that of Robert E. Lee, 54 male members of the Stratford line are known to have lived to maturity. Five of them were professional men who did not hold office. Of the remaining 49, 37 had some record of public service. These 37 included 10 Burgesses, 10 members of the state legislature, 6 professional soldiers, 3 naval officers, 6 militia officers, 6 members of the Colonial Council, 4 members of revolutionary conventions, 3 governors or acting governors, 2 signers of the Declaration of Independence, 2 diplomatists, 3 members of the Continental Congress, 3 members of the United States Congress, 1 member of the United States Cabinet, 1 Secretary of the Colony, 1. London Alderman, one town mayor, one judge, five justices of the peace, two clerks and one deputy clerk of courts, and two prosecuting attorneys, a total of 72 offices. The record is the more impressive when it is remembered that during the later years of Richard Lee II the family was little in public life. Several of the families that had intermarried with the Lees had also contributed perceptibly to the life of Virginia, in some instances, perhaps, less because of special aptitude for politics than because their social position carried with it a certain right of leadership in a society where the franchise was much restricted. The Corbins supplied two Burgesses, one councillor, and one president of the council. Of the Carters and Moors, including the Spotswood ancestors of the Moors, one was Burgess, three were councillors, one was Speaker of the Burgesses, one was Treasurer, one was Acting Governor, and one, Alexander Spotswood, was Governor. The family of Robert E. Lee's paternal grandmother, Lucy Grimes, was connected with the Genie stock. Among her forebears and family were one governor, two receivers general, one auditor general, two members of council, two burgesses, one militia officer, one justice, and one sheriff. The Blands, the family of Robert E. Lee's paternal great-grandmother, were less numerous than the Lees, but they were brilliant people and, with the related Bennett stock, listed one governor, one speaker of the Burgesses, four members of the council, two Burgesses, one member of a revolutionary convention, one member of the Continental Congress, one member of the Congress of the United States, one revolutionary soldier, and one militia officer. Robert E. Lee's remoter kinsmen held other posts almost as numerous and distinguished. Of Virginia's seven signers of the Declaration of Independence, he was connected with five. In eastern Virginia, there were few families of the highest standing whose members Robert Lee did not call cousin. These partial lists of the major lines of Robert E. Lee's inheritance show, in summary, that to and including his own generation, his ancestors and immediate kinsmen filled the following offices the indicated number of times. Office number of times held. Governor or acting Governor 7. President of Council 1. Speaker of the House of Burgesses 2. Secretary of the Colony 2. Member of the Council 16. Colonial Treasurer 1. Colonial Receiver General 2. Colonial Auditor General 1. Burgess 17. Member State Legislature 10. Member Revolutionary Conventions 5. Soldier 7. Naval Officer 3. London Alderman 1. Militia Command 8. Sheriff 1. Court Clerk 2. Deputy Clerk 1. Justice of the P6. Prosecuting Attorney 2. Town Mayor 1. Signer Declaration 2. Diplomatist 2. Member U.S. Cabinet 1. Member Cont Congress 3. Member U.S. Congress 4. Federal Judge 1. In seeking and holding office, the earlier Lees displayed a degree of clan spirit. Robert E. Lee's grandfather, the second Henry Lee, announcing to William Lee in 1775 the death of William's brother Philip, said downrightly, the vacancy I hope you will use your utmost efforts to fill up in council with your brother Thomas or Francis. I could wish the honor of the family to be fixed at Stratford, as to your bro, Colonel Richt. Henry I would by no means have him out of the House of Burgesses, as there is at present the greatest reason to expect he will succeed Mr. Randolph as Speaker, who is old and infirm. Some years later Richard Henry Lee, William's brother, solicited Governor Patrick Henry to make Henry Lee Commissioner for the estate of a Mr. Paradise, a British sympathizer. 
On one occasion, the Lees had to choose among their own kinspeople for the public wheel. Richard Henry Lee, in Congress, wrote his brother Francis in 1787, urging him to prevail upon their eccentric cousin, Richard Lee, to resign from the Virginia legislature or to stand aside so that light horse Harry Lee might represent the county of Westmoreland. I know, said he, it is like persuading a man to sign his own death warrant, but upon my word the state of public affairs renders the sacrifice of place and vanity necessary. Always in the attitude of the Lees toward the offices they held, there was a conscious and sensitive regard for public opinion. The feeling of generations of the family was expressed by young Lucinda Lee when she insisted, about 1787, in a journal kept for a girlfriend, I would not have you think from this that I pay no regard to the opinion of the world, far from it, next to that of a good conscience, the opinion of the world is to be regarded. The Lees without exception were revolutionaries in 1775. The sons of Thomas Lee, who were then the chief representatives of the family, were in the full vigor of their early forties or late thirties, and were among the leaders in the rising against England. Henry Lee II was forty-seven, and though he was not so influential as his cousin Richard Henry, he was as ardent in his opposition to the policy of the crown. But in no other crisis of their 160 years of residence in Virginia, prior to the birth of Robert E. Lee, had the sympathies of the Lees been with the younger government or with the apostles of change. Their older allegiance was their stronger. It was so from the time of the first Richard Lee. His heart was with the Cavaliers, and when Charles I was executed, Lee hired a Dutch vessel, according to an admiring contemporary's account, freighted her himself, went to Brussels, surrendered up Sir William Barclay's, Berkeley's, old commission, for the government of that province, and received a new one from His Present Majesty, a loyal action and deserving my commemoration. Singularly enough, the second Richard Lee had to meet a like test on two occasions. He opposed Bacon's rising against Berkeley, and for his obduracy spent seven weeks in the rebel's prison, at least 100 miles from his own home whereby he received great prejudice in his health by hard usage, and very greatly in his whole estate by his absence. Little more than a decade later, after the flight of James II, when Parliament called for a new oath of allegiance to William and Mary, Richard Lee II was unwilling to subscribe to it. He was a member of the Council of Virginia at the time and quit that body rather than forswear his fealty to the Stuarts. It must have been some years before he reconciled himself to the new regime and acknowledged the House of Orange. Three generations later, when the father of Robert E. Lee was governor of Virginia, James Madison inquired whether Light Horse Harry was disposed to accept the command of the forces that might be sent to the Ohio to redeem St. Clair's defeat at the hands of the Indians. Lee was pleased with the prospect, but as he wrote Madison, he did not like to abandon my native country, to whose goodness I am so much indebted. He added, no consideration on earth could induce me to act a part, however gratifying to me, which could be construed into disregard or forgetfulness of this commonwealth. Henry Lee did not have to make a choice then between Virginia and the Union. Two years later, when called to lead a militia force to put down the Whiskey Boys' Rebellion he left his post of governor and thereby almost forfeited the office. But he held fast to his first allegiance to his country, as he often called Virginia. In 1798, as a member of the House of Delegates of his state, he defended the federal alien and sedition laws against the resolutions of condemnation sponsored by the Jeffersonians. Exhausting argument and realizing that his was the losing side, he concluded his address with this language, should my efforts, Mr. Chairman, be unavailing, I shall lament my country's fate, and acquiesce in my country's will, and amidst the surrounding calamities, derive some consolation from recollecting my humble exertions to stop the mad career. Thus the Lees had the choice between the older and the newer allegiance presented to them six times in five generations, and in every instance except that of the American Revolution, their decision was to support the older government. That was a tradition that became a part of the inheritance of the greatest Lee of the sixth generation. Robert Lee did not get all these data from the paper that William Lee had written and Cassius Lee, in 1838, had lent him. Some of the most interesting facts about his ancestors Robert Lee never knew, because they were not established until his own fame had made men curious to ascertain more precisely what was his background. Lee, however, was conscious that he had traditions of honor, of loyalty, and of public service. He set himself to be worthy of them, precisely as he had made Washington his model, almost without being conscious of it. Chapter 11, An Established Place in the Corps 
Some dim hope had been cherished that Congress would appropriate money at the short session of December 1838, March 4, 1839, for rivers and harbors. In the acute financial distress of the government, following the notorious specie circular this hope was not realized. Congress was hard put to provide revenues for the indispensable work of the departments without undertaking projects that could wait. Not only so, but Lee was called upon to divide part of the money remaining from previous appropriations. $20,000 of the balance left in his hands by his close economy were diverted to pay for the removal of snags from the Missouri River under the direction of Captain Shreve. Lee was told, the department is particularly desirous that, under the present state of political affairs, you should not be involved in the details of these civil works more than is absolutely necessary. It has no fears that you will consider this arrangement as indicating any purpose of lessening your trust or restricting your functions. He was further enjoined to keep operations in such a condition that they may be transferred to other hands on the briefest notice. This was discouraging to a man who was deeply interested in the completion of an improvement he believed to be of great value to the entire West. Moreover, through the whole of 1839, Lee's financial transactions with banks that held tightly to all available funds during a monetary crisis were tedious and difficult. Before he could begin work that year, with his scant balance, Lee had to take his wife home. She was expecting her fourth baby in June. Sentiment and prudence alike dictated that she should be delivered at Arlington rather than on the frontier. The children, of course, had to go with her. The family accordingly set out on May 1, reached Wheeling, Virginia, by steamboat on May 8, and took a private stage for Frederick, Maryland. They proceeded as leisurely as possible for Mrs. Lee's comfort, but they had very hard travel on May 11, the last day of their journey. No ill effect followed, however, and the mother and her brood were safely placed in Mrs. Custis's care late that night. Lee was pleased that only eleven days had been consumed en route from St. Louis to Washington. In communicating the news of that feat to his old-time comrade, Charles Talcott, he confided, with some adroitness, the reason that had brought him east. We have six little Lees here now, he said, and will then have seven, three of whom belong to my brother, which I have borrowed for the occasion. The family, he explained, with the new accession, was to leave about August 1st for the mountains, not to return until the beginning of October. It was during his brief stay in Washington that Lee sought to ascertain the facts about the dismissal of General Greshet and procured for him certain papers that Greshet believed would be helpful to him in the rehearing of his case. Investigation did not disclose much. Lee confessed, before he left, that he was still in the dark, though satisfied that the condition of Greshet's accounts was only a pretext for action that had previously been determined on. Leaving Arlington about May 25, 1839, Lee started out alone for the West and pursued a new route via Staunton, Virginia, a journey that he was to remember 22 years thereafter when he followed part of the same road at the beginning of a forlorn campaign to redeem disaster. He reached Guyandot, on the Ohio, Sunday, June 2, and before he even alighted from the stage he had the good fortune to see a steamer coming downstream. He hailed her, got aboard, and went on to Cincinnati, which was her destination. Thence he voyaged to Louisville, where he arrived on the evening of June 4. His thoughts naturally were of his growing family and of the indulgent mother left to care for them. The familiar note of homesickness crept into the letter he wrote his wife the morning after he got to Louisville. You do not know how much I have missed you and the children, my dear Mary. To be alone in a crowd is very solitary. In the woods I feel sympathy with the trees and birds, in whose company I take delight, but experience no pleasure in a strange crowd. I hope you are all well and will continue so, and therefore must again urge you to be very prudent and careful of those dear children. If I could only get a squeeze at that little fellow turning up his sweet mouth to Key's babe. You must not let them run wild in my absence, and will have to exercise firm authority over all of them. This will not require severity or even strictness, but constant attention and an unwavering course. Mildness and forbearance, tempered by firmness and judgment, will strengthen their affection for you while it will maintain your control over them. Back in St. Louis, Lee received word, about July 1, 1839, that he had a new daughter, who had arrived on June 18 and had been named Annie Carter Lee. The father was philosophical about the event, do you know, he remarked in a letter to McKay, how many little Lees there are now? 
It is astonishing with what facility the precious creatures are dressed up for the return of their papa. I am sure to be introduced to a new one every Christmas. They are the dearest annuals of the season. I am informed that there is now at home a little long-nosed fellow waiting for my first benediction and my sister Nanny has a black-headed duplicate to greet the arrival of my sailor brother from the West Indies. With what a bountiful hand are these little responsibilities distributed? His domestic affairs thus settled in the fashion of his fecund generation, Lee dispatched Lieutenant Bliss to begin the removal of rock from the Des Moines Rapids as soon as the stage of the river permitted. For his own part he prepared to continue work on the dike above Bloody Island, which had been somewhat damaged the previous winter by the accumulation of ice against the section that had not been strengthened with rock. To increase his funds for the enterprise Lee got permission from the Bureau to sell the equipment he did not need for his reduced force. He had, also, to abandon his revised plan for running the dike and under orders from the chief engineer return to the original project of a dike perpendicular to the Illinois Pier. There was added to the design an intersecting dam which was intended to secure the head of the dike on the Illinois side. Despite these discouragements Lee was cheerful, as he usually was when so busy that he had no time to think of his distant family or the uncertainties and disappointments of the public service. We are just getting to work at the rapids with a good prospect of success, he wrote his friend, Major W. A. Hitchcock on July 24. The river here has not been very high this year. The bar has elongated from the foot of the Bloody Island, and the head of Duncan's Island has been proportionately shortened. The river is falling quite rapidly and I am preparing to get to work here the first of next month. By August 12, the Mississippi was low enough for Lee to begin construction. It was undertaken with all his energy. He went in person with the hands every morning about sunrise, the then mayor of St. Louis wrote, and worked day by day in the hot broiling sun, the heat being greatly increased by the reflection of the river. He shared the hard task and common fare and rations furnished to the common laborers, eating at the same table, in the cabin of the steamboat used in the prosecution of the work, but never on any occasion becoming too familiar with the men. He maintained and preserved under all circumstances his dignity and gentlemanly bearing, winning and commanding the esteem, regard, and respect of everyone under him. He also slept in the cabin of the steamboat, moored to the bank near the works. In the same place, Lt. Lee, with his assistant, Henry Kaiser, ESQ, worked at his drawings, plans and estimates every night till 11 o'clock. The driving of piles and the extension of the pier to the head of Bloody Island had been going on just two weeks when a man named Morris, a property holder on the Illinois shore, procured from the judge of the Second Illinois Circuit an injunction against the further prosecution of the work. Lee had procured the necessary permits from the owners of Bloody Island and from the owner of the land where the dike left the Illinois shore, but he was restrained by the court because it was alleged that the harbor improvements would create a shoal on the Illinois side and would injure property values in Brooklyn, a town laid out on paper below the ferry that operated to St. Louis. Lee regarded the argument as fallacious and the fears of the Illinois complainants as unfounded. He reported the proceedings to United States District Attorney for Illinois and requested him to move to have the injunction vacated, but that was all he could do. There was little probability that the case would be decided before the regular term of the court in February, 1840. Work at St. Louis, therefore, had to be suspended after August 27, despite many grumblings and some protests that Lee should go ahead in the face of the court order, but the improvement in conditions on the river had been great. The dike at the lower end of Bloody Island was holding fast and had given so much added strength to the current that a further section of Duncan's Island and a stretch of 1,700 feet of the bar above the island had been swept away. Where the bar had previously been dry, when the river was still six feet above low water, a two-fathom channel now gave access to the wharves. The upper dike, though still unfinished, had so contracted the sweep of the river that a new channel, a thousand feet wide, had been cut through what, as recently as 1838, had been a dry sandbar. Steamboats now had a straight course down the river. The results satisfied Lee, but when he came to sum them up he gave warning that the project had to be carried to completion if the improvement was to be permanent. A year's delay, he cautioned, might produce a wholly changed situation. The expenditures had only been some $57,000 of the estimated $158,000.
For the work on the Upper Mississippi in 1839, Lee had proposed that a large party be organized, with ample machinery, and that the rock in the river be attacked simultaneously at several points, so that if interruption came at one place this extensive plan had to be curtailed. With no money except the balance carried over from 1838, Lee was forced to confine his activities to the Des Moines Rapids. And in order that no charge of favoritism could be brought, he was directed to divide his time and money between the bad lower chain, opposite the modern Keokuk, and the still worse English chain, slightly more than two miles upstream. Work began early and favorably, with Lieutenant Bliss in charge. The weather was mild. The river was low. Lee himself was at the rapids about the middle of July. He saw the redoubtable Dick Tillman then, returning from Dubuque, where he had been to award a contract for a road. General Brooke happened at Galena while we were there, Lee subsequently reported to Joe Johnston, and besides the pleasure of meeting him again, we had much sport in fighting the battles of Old Point over again. But it was done temperately and in a temperance manner, for the general has forsworn strong potations, and our refreshments consisted of only soda water and ice cream, delicacies that had been untasted by the general for the last nine years, and four times a day did we pay our respects to the fountain and freezer. Dick, finding some spare days on his hands, accoutred as he was, plunged into a pleasure party for the Falls of St. Anthony that came along in fine spirits with music playing and colors flying. The upper English chain at the Des Moines Rapids was the best point at which to begin work. Going north through this chain the anxious navigator first encountered a detached bed of rock and then entered a channel not more than 30 feet wide, obscurely marked and swept by a heavy current. This channel ran parallel to the Illinois shore for some 500 yards and then turned at right angles to the west and wound around a reef in a course that could hardly be followed at all when the water was low. From the pool reached at the end of these windings, the channel passed through another detached bed of rock. Under Lee's plan the narrow 30-foot channel at the lower end of the chain was widened to 50 to 80 feet, according to the position. The difficult windings above the right angle were cut to a straight channel for the removal of the beds of rock at the head and the foot of the channel. From the English chain, the whole force was moved down the river to attack the lower chain. Here the great obstacle to navigation was a flat reef 200 feet long and upwards of 40 feet wide, with only a narrow chute on either side. As there was a bad cross-current through this chain, as well as a crooked channel and a shoal, navigation at low water was impossible. Bliss removed nearly all the reef during the period of operations at the lower chain and opened a passage 50 feet wide and nearly 4 feet deep. Before suspending work at the close of the season Lee set eight buoys, though he suspected that the ice would carry them away that winter. When the boats were brought back to St. Louis from the rapids and the men were discharged in the fall of 1839, some 2,000 tons of stone had been removed. Lee believed that a tolerable season's work had been done, considering the lack of cash, but he was persuaded that sound economy called for the construction of boats and machinery capable of working a larger force of men. The decay of boats and the time spent in repairing them, he reported, consumed nearly half of the appropriations. He had few added opportunities to study costs and results that autumn, for after the injunction had halted operations in St. Louis Harbor, Colonel Totten, back in Washington, had shown no disposition to let Lee kick his heels idly off the side of the steamboat. Instead, Lee was sent to inspect improvement work on the Ohio, and then down the Mississippi, where he made a faithful count of snags. Lee was next ordered to the Missouri and again up the Father of Waters to Lamalee's chain, midway the Des Moines Rapids. Through this chain a very practicable channel was found that would admit of easy navigation simply by widening a narrow passage. In making these reports on the activities, particularly in that on the improvement of the Missouri River, Lee argued downrightly for internal improvements to help build up the West. A Whig politician would hardly have been more serious. Having no duties to perform during the winter season either in the harbor or at the rapids, Lee procured leave of absence and made the long journey overland to Arlington. He had been gone more than seven months and he was overjoyed to be home. I suppose you have heard of my escape from the West, he jubilantly wrote his cousin, Hill Carter of Shirley. You must not understand that I am displeased with the state of things in that country, on the contrary, I think it is a great country and will one day be a grand one, all is life, animation and prosperity, but that it is far more pleasant for me to be here than there. 
I felt so elated when I again found myself within the confines of the ancient dominion that I nodded to all the old trees as I passed, chatted with the drivers and stable boys, shook hands with the landlords, and in the fullness of my heart, don't tell cousin Mary, wanted to kiss all the pretty girls I met. His real reward was not the greetings of wayside maidens, but the sight of his new baby, Annie. As he gathered his children about him, he must have felt patriarchal for a man just thirty-three. His progeny now numbered four, a boy of eight and another approaching his fourth birthday, a girl in her sixth year and the newcomer in the cradle. It may have been at this time, during the winter of his return from the West, that the youthful Custis unwittingly impressed on Lee his ever-increasing moral responsibility for this growing household. Lee took Custis out for a walk one snowy day, and when they had plowed along together a while, Custis dropped behind. After a few minutes Lee looked back and found that his little boy was behind him, imitating his every move and walking in the tracks the father had made in the snow. When I saw this, Lee told one of his friends long afterwards, I said to myself, it behooves me to walk very straight when this fellow is already following in my tracks. Lee was apprehensive that he would be sent to the Red River, but after four happy months of leave, approximately for the somewhat dull social season of January-April, 1840, he was assigned to temporary duty in the office of the chief engineer, waiting for the decision of Congress on further appropriations for the Mississippi. Virtually all the money that had previously been voted for the work had been spent, there was no use going west again until he knew whether it would be to resume operations or to close the project, unfinished. On July 21, Congress adjourned without allowing a dollar for the enterprise. Not only so, but the temper of the lawmakers was such that Lee doubted whether Congress would resume internal improvements for years to come. Lee was convinced by the politicians' arguments, stoutly as he had advocated the work entrusted to him. As far as I could learn, he said, Congressmen seem satisfied to leave the subject to the individual states, and I think the U.S. have done their part in commencing it. Nothing remained except to cover the long road once more and write finest to all the hopes of a completed federal enterprise. I anticipate no pleasure on the trip, I assure you, but altogether the reverse, Lee wrote in disgust to Charles Mackay. The rivers are all low, weather hot and country sickly and I am afraid I shall have to go all the way over land. Receiving his orders on July 24, Lee started west shortly thereafter, and on his arrival in St. Louis began a survey of the effects of the ice and freshets on the piers he had constructed in 1838-1839. The dike from the Illinois shore to the head of Bloody Island continued to operate, as Lee had expected, in throwing the current west of the island, thereby deepening the channel on the Missouri side. The other dike was still diverting the water and throwing it against the head of Duncan's Island, which was steadily being washed away. By this time, the channel between Bloody Island and Duncan's Island was deep enough to pass the largest of the Mississippi steamboats to the St. Louis wharves. If the Missouri side of Bloody Island were revet with stone to protect it from a curious cross-current that had developed, the work, it appeared, would permanently serve its purpose, when finished. There was, also, a new small shoal near the foot of the lower pier and between it and the city. This gave Lee some temporary concern. Watching it closely, however, he concluded that it was gradually diminishing and that it consisted only of sand washed downstream from the vicinity of Bloody Island. Up at the Des Moines Rapids, Lee found that the buoys he had placed the previous autumn had washed away. The new channels cut in 1839 were being used exclusively and had facilitated navigation. The improvement, however, was incomplete and failed to give passing ships the depth of direct channel the growing commerce of the river required. Now that he was back in the West, he was not so philosophical about the abandonment of the project to the state and the city. It seemed a shame to have made so effective a beginning and not to finish it after so much labor. But orders were given to be obeyed. The maintenance of the equipment was so expensive that it was uneconomical to retain some of the boats in the hope they might be useful when and if Congress authorized resumption. Lee accordingly sold at public auction all the boats, the machinery at St. Louis, and the greater part of that which had been employed at the rapids. It was with a heavy heart that he did this. Lee expressed to me, the mayor of St. Louis recorded, his chagrin and mortification at being compelled to discontinue the work. It seemed as if it were a great personal misfortune to stop when the work was about half finished. Lee's distress was deepened by another attack of the homesickness that so often beset him in the West. The very sight of children made him yearn for his own. 
he wrote Mrs. Lee. A few evenings since, feeling lonesome, as the saying is, and out of sorts, I got on a horse and took a ride. On returning through the lower part of the town, I saw a number of little girls all dressed up in their white frocks and pantalettes, their hair plaited and tied up with ribbons, running and chasing each other in all directions. I counted twenty-three nearly the same size. As I drew up my horse to admire the spectacle a man appeared at the door with the twenty-fourth in his arms. My friend, said I, are all these your children? Yes, he said, and there are nine more in the house, and this is the youngest. Upon further inquiry, however, I found that they were only temporarily his, and that they were invited to a party at his house. He said, however, he had been admiring them before I came up, and just wished that he had a million of dollars and that they were all his in reality. I do not think the eldest exceeded seven or eight years old. It was the prettiest sight I have seen in the West, and perhaps in my life. On October 6, Lee completed his last work at St. Louis, the writing of his reports. A few days later he started back home, where his presence was needed for the usual reason, the approach of still another baby. Lee naturally was not anxious to have a fifth child arrive while Annie was under two years of age, but, as usual, he accepted the inevitable. Among the things that then distracted my attention, Lee wrote in March, 1841, was the arrival of another little Lee, whose approach, however long foreseen, I could have disposed with for a year or two more. However, as she was in such haste to greet her pa, I am now very glad to see her. Lee's return to Washington, several months before the advent of this impatient youngster, marked the end of his labor on the Mississippi. Covering roughly the 31st to the 34th years of his life, it was his initial independent detail as a responsible supervising engineer. It taught him little that he did not know already concerning the management of labor, the handling of accounts, and the award of contracts, but it did three things for him. First, it developed his ingenuity in the practice of his profession and it strengthened still further his quiet confidence in his ability to meet unexpected problems. There had been no cocksureness in his approach to the task of diverting the current of the Mississippi. He had sought and doubtless had received the counsel of Shreve, of Greshet, and of Talcott, the last of whom had been studying a similar condition on the Hudson. In some of his proposals, Lee had been overridden by Greshet. Always deferring cheerfully, as well as officially, to the chief engineer, he had shown, on the other hand, no disposition to dodge his responsibility. He hesitated only once over the safe length of the pier from the Illinois shore to the head of Bloody Island, and then he chose the bolder alternative. As far as his method may be reconstructed, it was thoroughly scientific, he analyzed carefully the conditions he had to correct and he did not start construction until he was entirely satisfied that the solution he proposed was the one that gave the best promise of the desired result at a reasonable figure. As he left the West, he was more than ever convinced that study of a problem, detached and adequate study on the ground, was the engineer's first duty and his greatest pledge of success. The St. Louis enterprise brought him, in the second place, into close relations with municipal officers and a critical public. He won the support of the officials, as he did of nearly all the men with whom he was closely associated. The people who had opposed the diversion of the current, because they believed the improvement would hurt their imaginary town of Brooklyn, failed to arouse any personal feeling in his heart. He reasoned with them candidly and in the light of all the facts, but he did not get angry. His experience in the injunction proceedings neither soured nor disgusted him. He met it with quiet poise as one of the vexations of his work. In this respect, he had gained greatly since he left Fort Monroe. His letters show none of the spirit, half-jesting though it was, that had made him wish in 1834 he might have a hand in stewing Macomb for the general's treatment of Talcott. Finally, Lee's two years and a half on the St. Louis project established his professional standing. He went to Missouri a promising young officer, he returned an engineer of recognized reputation in his corps. A difficult task had been brilliantly performed, and the fullest praise for it had been accorded him. From that time onward, though his friend General Greshet was no longer chief engineer and he was not yet intimate with Colonel Totten, he had the highest esteem of his superiors. He did not realize it at the time, for sometimes that old intermittent spirit of frustration arose in his heart and the neglect of the army by Congress made him think he was working in a blind alley. 
Yet the fact remained, the opportunities that were to come him in Mexico were created at St. Louis. The withdrawal of federal aid did not prove the end of the St. Louis project. What Congress refused to do, the city undertook on its own account. Henry Kaiser, who had been one of Lee's civil assistants, was named to carry on the improvement at the expense of the municipality. He consulted Lee frequently about his difficulties and held to that officer's plan. Duncan's Island was washed completely away, and Bloody Island became, in time, a part of East St. Louis. The people of the city gave chief credit to Lee. By his rich gift of genius and scientific knowledge, wrote Mayor Darby, Lieutenant Lee brought the Father of Waters under control. I made known to Robert E. Lee, in appropriate terms, the great obligations the authorities and citizens generally were under to him, for his skill and labor in preserving the harbor. One of the most gifted and cultivated minds I had ever met with, he was as scrupulously conscientious and faithful in the discharge of his duties as he was modest and unpretending. He had none of that coddling and petty, puerile planning and scheming which men of little minds and small intellectual caliber used to make and take care of their fame. The labors of Robert E. Lee can speak for themselves.